Hi, hello, congratulations, you've all made it to Friday, everybody. It is the end of the week. It is 5 p.m. Eastern time, and you are watching the one and only Dollar Cooking Show, the best cooking show on Twitch. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome on in. I see that we have a bunch of lovely sous chefs in the chat at the moment. I see that we have Trash Can Cat Mom, we have uh, Osniatsky, uh, we have Munham, we have Laura, we have J. Krulls, we have Kishma, we have Laz, we have Aliam as well. We have so many of you in here at the moment. It's really, really good to see all of you. Hello to Jessalyn, hello Lego Batman fan, hello to Paris as well. Nice shirt, why thank you. Hello to Robin, hello to Munham, not sure if I already said hi to you. Hello to Condition Bleen, hello, hello, hello. So. Everybody, welcome on in. I hope you've all been having a really good Friday today. If you're just coming off work, well, welcome on in. It's time for the weekend. The weekend begins now. And I'm really excited about today's stream because today's stream is a lot of problem solving. Today's stream is actually about fixing a problem that I have in my home kitchen really often. And we'll talk about what that is in just a second. Um, guys, so here's an issue. And I don't know if this is an issue that others necessarily have. I oftentimes talk about making the most out of the produce that you have at home, and I like teaching you different ways to go about it and using it. However, historically, I have actually been quite a bit of a hypocrite. Whenever I would buy heavy cream, I would use it for maybe a sauce once, I'd maybe use it for a soup once, maybe use it a couple of times in a coffee, but then my heavy cream has consistently gone bad in my refrigerator. I have not really had a good way of using up a lot of heavy cream at once because I don't do a lot of sweets, I don't do a lot of baking, I don't do pastry like that, I'm not going to be making butter because I think that's too much effort. Um, and so, I was looking for a nice way of using up the heavy cream, and the heavy cream is the start of today's show. And guys, the solution that I have stumbled upon is to make drop cream biscuits, two ingredient drop cream biscuits. And we'll talk about the beauty of this and why we're doing this in just a second also. Thank you, Explicit. So guys, heavy cream, I always have it. And it always, um, well, occasionally, sometimes in coffee, occasionally. I typically only take my coffee black though. Um, so guys, my heavy cream, more often than not, it ends up going bad in the fridge. And when I say we're going to be making drop cream biscuits, I don't mean the British kind, I mean the American kind. Um, so they're going to be really, really delicious. So there was a reason why I didn't make biscuits in the past. As you guys may know, I am an avid hater of working with doughs that you have to roll out at home. I think the whole process of rolling out dough in a home setting is completely a novelty unless you have somebody who stays at home and their entire job is to cook. Because you have to flour the surface and then you have to get a rolling pin, you have to flour it and then you have to clean up your entire table and oh no, the dough is springing back, what do you do? Working with dough at home is a mess and it is a bit of a difficulty and it's not something that I love to do. But notice how I specified that this is going to be a drop biscuit. This is not the kind of flaky, super like stacked biscuit that has like a laminated dough with layers. This is a bit more of a crumbly biscuit. This is quite literally, we mix the dough, we spoon it and we bake it. Mix the dough, spoon it, bake it. That's all that there is to it. In life, there's two things that nothing is more beautiful than. There is nothing more beautiful than a woman, and there is nothing more beautiful than a freshly baked bread. And this is such a nice way of getting freshly baked bread in a home setting. Because typically speaking, you know, the whole process of rolling it out and making the dough, it can be a bit of a headache. This is a two ingredient dough. This is a two ingredient bread that can be served alongside anything that you possibly would like. It's so simple, it's so neutral, it can be, about so, it can be served with so many different things. I think this drop biscuit is going to be really remarkable because what this is going to be is a two ingredient, easy to make homemade bread that you can make at any given point without needing to roll it out using up leftover heavy cream. To me, everything is just all falling into place. It just sounds perfect. And so that's gonna be the last thing we do today. Um, it's gonna be a real experiment. So if it works out, this is going to become something that is a staple of my home routine. So I'm really excited about the biscuits. And so alongside the biscuits, I'm going to be making a really delicious chicken soup. Uh, this chicken soup is somewhat inspired by, you know, like a Latin American uh, caldo de pollo. Uh, so it's going to have chicken, it's going to have plenty of vegetables. And as always guys, we exclusively work with whole chickens on the stream. Does anybody know why we work with whole chickens? Because first of all, it's cheaper. Second of all, we get the incredible incredible byproduct that is all of the chicken bones. I never go out of my way to buy pre-made chicken stock. Sometimes I use powdered bouillon, which I'll also be using today, but box chicken stock is a mess. Box chicken stock is, is way too expensive for what it is. Guys, get into the habit of buying whole chickens. You will have an endless supply of beautiful chicken bones. Also, hello to Val. Welcome on in. 
Um, and then we'll be able to get all the meat and we'll be making a really, really beautiful soup out of this bad boy right here. Uh, yesterday I bought him and I put him on a sheet tray so that it's not sopping wet uh, when we actually cook with it. And we're go I'm going to teach you, I'm gonna show you how to break down a whole chicken. Okay, and so alongside it, we have I have some tomatoes here because I'm thinking like a really nice, delicious, like sort of tomato chicken soup. Uh, I have some tomatoes. I have some Sugano chilies as well. Um, while we'll be yes chefing, I'm not sure. But you know what? I'm gonna make everybody say yes chef right now. Everybody, are we tapped in? Are you ready to go food today? I wanna hear a nice Susanna. Yes chef, please and thank you. Okay, and now let's talk about some of my vegetables. Nothing too crazy, guys. I have some leftover kale, which I'll throw in. I have some carrots, I have some celery. Just classic, basic stuff. You can basically use any kind of vegetable that you would like uh, for today's soup, right? So the carrot's gonna add a really nice sweetness. The kale, I just wanna use up the leftovers that I have because that's what it ultimately means to cook at home. Additionally, for today, I got uh, some fresh corn because I thought some fresh corn would be really, really delicious uh, for the chicken soup itself. Again, I'm inspired by a caldo de pollo, so we'll be shucking it and we'll just be boiling it, nothing too crazy. Today's soup is going to be a fairly simple one, but we will be making it on stock. Now, the most important ingredient that we have to talk about for the biscuits, guys, this you need to make sure that you have. Because we're making two ingredient drop biscuits, one of these ingredients is, uh, excuse me, self-rising flour. And there's a reason why we buy self-rising flour and not all-purpose flour. Some people think that all-purpose flour plus baking soda equals self-rising flour. And technically it does, but there's a very specific distinction, at least with the uh, King Arthur brand of self-rising flour, and that it is a soft wheat a softer type of wheat. Now, I forgot exactly what kind of distinction that is. I think it just has slightly less gluten content. Somebody please fact check me on that. But all purpose flours, they tend to be made out of a harder wheat. This is made out of a slightly softer wheat. So you could theoretically just substitute this with flour, regular all purpose flour plus baking soda, but self rising flour is what this is gonna be based off of, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and just set this behind me. And I think that should do it for today. We have a bunch of cumin seeds and we have some fresh oregano. And guys, we'll be getting started in just a moment. Is everybody ready? I wanna hear another big resounding yes chef. We gotta break down the chicken. We gotta make a chicken stock. We got a bunch of vegetables to chop. We have a lot on the dial agenda. Also, for those of you that haven't already done so, please check out my Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. I would love to be able to do these full time. I would love to be able to continue to people uh, how to cook well, show people how to cook at home and what it means to cook at home. Today is going to be all about using up leftovers and making something really special out of it. So I'm super excited for the biscuits today. And as always, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, please do not hesitate to ask me because I am here to teach you how to cook. And I'm not here to just teach you how to make a recipe. I am here to teach you what it means to understand food. So there is no such thing as a bad question. You can ask me as obvious questions as you think they are, and I will never embarrass you for them because I am here to help you out. So guys, we're going to be starting off by making the chicken stock. I'm just going to be quickly rolling up my sleeves. Okay. Because I, I just want to help you. I want to teach you guys, right? This isn't about me making food that I just want to eat. I just want to show you what it means to build up that home ecosystem. So guys, I'll just quickly go over here and we'll talk about what we're using and why. I'm going to be using my pressure cooker, my Instant Pot. Um, and the reason why I'm using my Instant Pot is also just like a stream logistics thing. It's going to save us a little bit of time. It builds up pressure, it increases the boiling point of water. It's going to make the stock for us super, super quickly. Man on the Net asks, uh, what can you do if you over-salt a dish? Now, my advice is this, always shoot for under-salting. The way that you prevent this is to under-salt something, right? Because you can always add more. Now, to actually get rid of salt, it's almost impossible. The only way that you can do it is by adding in a bunch of other bland ingredients. Unfortunately, there is nothing that you can really do to take out existing salt. You can only dilute it with a bunch of other ingredients. So my suggestion will always just be undo shoot it because you can always add more, but you can't take any away. So guys, I have a little bit of water in my pressure cooker pot here. We'll be doing it on high pressure for 50 minutes. And now let's go ahead and just start building this lovely stock. guys. One of the best ways that you can elevate your home cooking is to get into the habit of making your own chicken stocks. Having a pressure cooker, for me, is one of the best ways to do so because a pressure cooker 
um, just saves you so much time so that you don't have to always have a pot on the stove. It saves you a lot of time. And then if you're going ahead and you're buying whole chickens, you don't have to go out of your way to buy sepu bones. Uh, explicit, you asked me, best way to make an omelet. So really good question. It depends on the kind of omelet that you're going for. Are you talking about a crispy omelet? Are you talking about a folded omelet? Are you talking about a French omelet? There is no best style of omelet. All of them are dependent on your intentions. And so my answer might not be very useful because I would actually have to physically demonstrate it. So what I just want to say is there is no best way to do something. There is only the best specific way relative to your intentions and what you want out of the omelet. Uh, which isn't a very helpful answer, I know, but we'll get there. So guys, I have some carrots. So one of the beauties of making a stock is that you get to go ahead and use up your vegetable scraps. These carrots I thoroughly scrubbed up. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off these tops and bottoms that I normally would not use, right? That I would normally just throw away. But by virtue of making a homemade stock, we can go ahead and just throw these in. We're intentionally not dicing these because we just want to be able to pluck them out. The carrots are just going to add some flavor. They're going to make the broth a little bit sweeter. So is this essential? No. In fact, the only aromatic that I actually consider is essential for a chicken stock uh, is the allium element itself because I love the aromatic quality of it. Is that a 12 inch utility knife? No, this is a Mizono UX10 Guto. So it's not a utility knife, it's a Guto, it's a type of chef's knife. Um, what's a dish slash food that you like differently from how it's normally prepared? A uh, man on the net asks me. Oh, that's a really good question. What is something that I like that's different from how it's normally prepared? Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that because I don't think I have an immediate answer for you. I'd have to really, really think about it. Okay, so guys, let's go ahead and now we're going to do the same exact thing with our lovely <coughs> celery. So the celery, actually, this one's a little bit dirty. Uh, I scrubbed it pretty thoroughly, or at least to the best of my ability. I'm going to be cutting off like this dried off top and also just throwing it into my pressure cooker pot. Um, I'm going to just get rid of this chunk because you know I don't even want this in the stock itself. I don't want it to impart any dirt accidentally, right? And I'm just gonna go ahead and put this bad boy back. And let's just go ahead and once again, just cutting off the top, the dried off top, the dried off bottoms, beautiful, into the pressure cooker pot they go. What is the best dish you like to eat that's not South slash North American? My favorite dish I like to eat, typically I love a lot of like different uh, Indian curries, right? I love a lot of lentil dishes, I love a lot of potato dishes. Uh, so like golden lentils or Ethiopian food, mwah, incredible. Okay, so guys, that's our uh, scraps from the celery, that's our scraps from the carrot itself. And now, this is what I consider to be one of the most important components in a stock, is the allium. You need to have an allium. You can use a leek, you can use shallots, whatever you want. I think an allium always is so, so good to have. So it's a fairly old onion which is one of the best ways to use up an old onion, right? And guys, same exact idea. I'm just intentionally keeping this whole. I'm making a little bit of an incision just so I can peel off this dried skin. And I'm intentionally keeping this whole so that we can easily, easily pluck this onion out later because we don't want to chop it up. We don't want it to break down. It's going to make the stock murky. I promise you this is going to do an excellent job of just infusing directly inside. Now, let's go ahead and also get a couple of uh, garlic cloves. And I do just mean a couple. Um, we're going to have plenty more garlic in this dish as well. And so for these bad boys, I do truly just mean two. We will be able to get plenty more garlic. I just find that when it's just extracted into a broth, it can get sometimes overpowering in a fairly unpleasant way. So guys, all I'm going to do is I'm gonna give it a little smash, a little bit of a press. We don't need to chop it. Okay. And all we have to do, oh, Moonha, stop it. Moonha, you gotta cut it out. I'm just going to take off the skins because sometimes they just uh, break up a little bit in the pot itself and it gets a little bit unpleasant. And guys, again, I don't want you throwing in good quality vegetables into your stock. The whole point of this is just to flavor the water. So all I'm using is an old onion and scraps. You don't have to go out of your way to buy amazing vegetables for this. Can I please get a yes, chef? I do want to make sure that that is evidently clear. And again, nothing here was essential except for the onion. Um, okay, guys, my last component is going to be a few bay leaves. What is a quintessential Eastern European dish? Boiled potatoes with dill and garlic and butter. You can't get more Eastern European than that, I think. So guys, some bay leaves. Uh, again, I'm just adding these in for an aromatic quality. 
Um, and again, at the end of the day, you just really need bones and I would say an onion to make a really, really good stock. So none of this stuff is necessary, I just have it. Um, but what I will be doing is, I will be intentionally keeping the stock bland. So I'm not adding any chilies, I'm not adding any spices, and I'm not adding any salt. And the reason for this is because if I were to add those things, all of a sudden my stock is a little bit more specific. The whole idea of making a chicken stock is to basically have it in your fridge, you have it in your freezer, and then to be able to implement it and use it for other things. If you were to overly season this now, you take it away from being a blank slate, and then it only later on has a very specific implementation. So we're going to get some extra stock, I'm going to save the extra stock, and then that lets me do whatever else I want with it. The reason we don't salt it is because if we reduce and boil down the stock, all of that salt will concentrate. We can always add salt, we can't take any away. The point of this is not for it to be a finished soup at the stage. The point of this is just for us to again build up that blank, meaty canvas. So guys, I am now going to go ahead and begin the processing of the chicken. So let's go ahead and get started. Everybody, you do not need to be intimidated when it actually comes to preparing whole chickens in a home setting. And I'm going to teach you, once again, how to properly break down a chicken. The only piece of equipment that you're going to need is a nice slender sharp knife. My typical petty knife that I use is out of commission at the moment because it's a little bit too dull. And we need it to be sharp so that we can cut through the skin easily. When you're breaking down a whole chicken, you're never cutting through bone. So again, this is going to be new for some of you. I want to challenge and I want to task you guys at home to get comfortable with breaking down whole chickens. Can I please get a yes chef from everybody watching? Please and thank you. So guys, I have here a fairly small whole chicken. I got this from my local Turkish butcher. Love that guy. Uh, his name is Carlos. He's Peruvian. He invited me over to go eat ceviche with his family in a couple of weeks. Uh, because they're having a party. So I'm really, really excited about that, actually. And, and he also tells me which days they get, like, meat deliveries now. Uh, so I have, like, a really nice reputation built up with him. So guys, here's what's going to happen. Uh, we have, of course, a few major parts of the chicken. We have two wings, we have two legs, we have two thighs, and then we have two breasts. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and dislodge some of these. We're going to go ahead and peel those breasts off, and I'm going to show you exactly just how easy all of this is. The first step that we're going to do, everybody, is we're going to take off the wings. So here's what we do. Oh, let's just go ahead and just get this out of here. Just a little tag left over. Again, I kept this on a sheet tray uncovered in the fridge. The reason why I did this was so that it could properly air dry. And you can see this chicken is no longer a sopping wet mess. You go to a supermarket, you buy a plastic wrapped chicken, and it is just drenched in water because it's been sitting there for days and it was de -thawed. It was it was thawed. So all you need to do, put it on a sheet tray, put it there for at least a few hours, put it there overnight, and I promise you, this is much more of a pleasant piece of meat to work with, okay? This is something that everybody should do with all the meat that they buy. Just air dry it a little bit. So guys, all I'm going to do, so we have the wing right here. The wing, the shoulder, and this is where it actually goes into the breast. All we really need to do is just make an incision where it meets, and then, because it's a small chicken, it's fairly tender, we can just go ahead and pop out this wing. Also, Cactus, I'm really happy to hear it. It's lovely to have you. Thank you for joining the stream. So guys, look at that. Look how easy it was to pop out that wing. And let's put it back on our sheet tray. And we're going to do the same thing with the other one, guys. All we do, small little teeny tiny incision all the way around, and then we just pop out the wing. And once we pop out the wing, look what happens. Bam. That's both wings gone. We didn't cut through the bone. Instead, we just went in between the joints. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take these wings because they're super small and they have almost no meat on them. Sorry, I just wanna make sure that there's no hair in my face. I'm just going to put the wings as well into the stock pot. So this is a little bit more wasteful. I'm not gonna be using the meat. It is just that small of a chicken and I don't typically cook with chicken wings anyways. Okay, so guys, now what we are left with, we are left with the legs and we are left with the breasts of this lovely chicken. So let's go ahead and get this also cleaned up. So the legs are maybe the easiest part to actually take off. You wanna make an incision, not close to the breast skin, but closer to the leg skin itself. Just make an incision and we're just going to go ahead and you can already see the leg is separating from the rest of the carcass. We make an incision, we cut all the way through, okay? And then we just go ahead and we flip it over and you're going to put in a bunch of pressure and pop out that leg. And so all that happens now, guys, right? You can just basically see it wants to come off. It wants to peel off. 
All that we do is we just follow this naturally occurring division. We go in between the joints where it meets the carcass, and now we have one beautiful chicken leg, completely intact. Let's go ahead and do the same exact thing with the other one. Look how easy it is, okay? All we do, we make an incision right here. We, don't, we try not to go into the meat at least. And then we go ahead and we flip it over. We pop out the leg, okay? And then all that we need to do, guys, is just carve off the thigh from the, less, from the rest of the carcass. We're never going through bone, we're just going in between the joints. So, the legs and the wings, those are the easiest part. Do not get intimidated, it is time for us to do the breast now. So, here is the anatomy of the chicken breast, here is the anatomy of the rest of the carcass. There is a bone going right down the middle that is dividing the breast into either side. So what we're going to do, is we're going to go ahead and make an incision on either side. I'm going to start with my right, right? So I'm going to go down here, I'm making an incision all the way until the skin is separated at the end. And then I'm going to go down here and I'm following the wishbone, because this is where the wishbone is tucked in. And I'm making another incision all the way here. We're not cutting all the way through. So guys, carcass, meat. And now all we have to do, we can just take our thumb through this stage and we're separating the meat from the carcass itself. We're just separating, right? We're basically gently peeling, peeling, peeling it off and take a look at what happens. This is exactly what you wanna see. You wanna see minimal meat attached to the carcass itself. Does everybody understand? Can I please get a yes, chef? I just wanna make sure that all of you are following this. All I'm doing at this stage, guys, is I'm gently, gently peeling it off of the carcass. Take a look at what happens. We have so little meat remaining on the bone itself. We're keeping the tender nice and intact as well while we're doing this, okay? And now, all that I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to cut through all the way here Okay, and let's go ahead and get, oh, that's a little bit too much of the carcass itself I ended up getting. That's totally okay. Let's just make that little trim right there and trim off that skin. Okay, and now guys, the breast is just basically sliding off, right? Really, really nice and easy. So let's just go ahead and make our last few cuts and get the rest of it off. One beautiful chicken breast, nicely and beautifully taken off the carcass. Let's go ahead and set it aside. You can see how little meat we actually have remaining on the carcass itself. And now let's go ahead and do the same thing with the other one. We make an incision. We cut through all the way to the other skin end, right? Just to make sure that it peels off really nice and easy for us. Uh, uh, my personal best, like timing wise? No, I have not. I don't actually consider myself too amazing at the process of breaking down chickens, even though I've done it a lot. I wanna probably go train under the butcher a little bit to try to get their input. What is my favorite British food that I like to eat? That's a good question because I don't eat a lot of British food explicit. So guys, once again, um, I'm going to think about your question for a second. So I'm just going to go ahead and continuously peel off the meat. I'm just peeling it off. I'm using my thumb here, I'm peeling it off. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And now we are left with this gorgeous breast. Go ahead and just slice it off the rest of the bone. Peel it off, peel it off. Excellent. And guys, guess what? We have officially broken down a whole chicken. And now we are left with this lovely little chicken carcass. Okay, and all that I'm going to do is I'm going to just barely twist off this like tail end, like the backbone of it. Okay, so that we have like two small pieces so it fits into my pot nice and easy. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw that into my pressure cooker pot. And guys, that is just how easy it is to get all of the bones together for a homemade delicious chicken stock. And that is why we make really good efficient use of a whole chicken. So let's ignore this. Let's go back to the pressure cooker pot. Let's do a recap here. Um, so we have vegetable scraps. We have carrots, celery, and onion. The carrots and celery and onion, they build up what is called the French mirepoix. It's an aromatic trinity an aromatic trio, okay? We have the chicken bones as well as the chicken wings themselves because they're really, really small. I'm going to go ahead and take this and I'm going to put this onto high pressure in my pressure cooker, my instant pot, for 50 minutes. Okay, and in that time, it's going to extract beautifully. You don't need to necessarily use a pressure cooker. The reason I'm using one is to save a lot of time. It's a really nice way to get into the habit of making homemade stocks if you're using a pressure cooker. You use a pressure cooker, you just get to set it and forget it. 50 minutes will basically do the same job as two hours of cook time because what you're effectively doing is you're raising the boiling point of it all. So guys, pressure cook, and I'm setting it on to high, and we're doing it for about 50 minutes or so. 
Although anyone past 40 minutes would also just be chill. It'd also just be good. Does anybody have any questions for me at the stage? Also, as far as my favorite British food goes, uh, I mean, I, I don't eat a lot of British food, I guess like fish and chips, right? A jacket potato, right? Something like that. Okay guys, so because of the fact that we're cooking at home, I'm going to go ahead and glove up and I'm going to go ahead and wash off my knife. Right? Because the most important thing that you can actually do in a home setting, guys, is to clean as you cook. Clean up as you go. We're not a prep restaurant. We don't have somebody else dedicated to doing the dishes. And that's why it is so important. That is why it is essential that if you have a dishwasher, that you have an empty dishwasher before you begin cooking. Can I please get a yes chef? Please and thank you. Who do I got winning melee and ult? Oh, that's a really good question, Manic Pixie Dream Homie. I haven't thought about Ultimate in a little bit, so uh, I'll also get back to you. I'm gonna go ahead and just wash off my knife really, really quickly. Just uh, get that done, get that out of the way, guys, because we might need it later on. A little bit of soap, a little bit of brush action. Just get that done, get that out of the way so it's out of sight. We don't have to think about it any further. So excuse me one second, guys, as I just get done with this knife, I'm getting all the little chicken bits off of it. Okay. Really, really important. Clean as you cook. Clean as you go. Everybody, in cooking, there is something that I like to call active time and then there is passive time. And so this might seem like a bit of an obvious concept, but it is something that I like explicitly laying out because in cooking, time management is almost 95% of the battle. When you have active time, that's when you're busy thinking about your other things that you have to do. Active time is essentially chopping something, it's slicing something, it's stirring something. It's when you have to actively occupy yourself and you're not waiting around. Passive time is what we have now, which is we just set the pressure cooker pot, we're in between tasks, and so we're now using this as an opportunity to clean up and put a couple of things away. Take some ingredients off of your table, especially if you have limited space. Have I been to cooking school? I have not. Cooking has just been my hyperfixation. It has been my lifelong interest of many, many, many years. I've been cooking since I was seven. I am now 21 years old. I consider myself amateur professional and I love teaching people how to cook. Okay, so guys, I got my cutting board away and thrown into the dishwasher. Let's go ahead and set up the next one and talk about what we, that's us, what we need to go ahead and do next. So my cutting board is ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and get my lovely chicken parts out of here. They've done a wonderful job for us. We broke them down slightly. Okay, so let's talk about our next steps, everybody. I'm just going to go ahead and wipe off my knife really quickly. Okay, so we're going to be doing a chicken tomato vegetable soup. And you know what that means? We have a lot of vegetable prep waiting and ready coming up ahead of us. So here's what we need to do. We're going to do one of my favorite things, which is charring some tomatoes. And so everybody, I want you all to tap in. I wanna make sure that I have all of your attention right now. Okay, cause this is going to get a little bit important. So when it comes to actually home cooking, uh, one of my favorite things to do well, just cooking in general, is I take a lot of inspiration and I take a lot of ideas and techniques from other cultures and other, uh, just like places, okay? And so, one of my favorite things to do that you see in Mexican cooking over and over again is the char component. It is the smoky kind of component, okay? By charring your vegetables, uh, for something like a salsa, or these tomatoes are actually going to, uh, going to go into the soup itself, we are developing a certain level of smokiness that we would not be able to find elsewhere. Smoke and the flavor of smokiness is one of the most misunderstood and under, uh, just like completely forgotten about flavors in Tex-Mex cooking and the way that Americans think about Mexican food. What I love doing is I love taking whole tomatoes. I love charring them, like right? getting the outside nice and smoky and then blending them down before we add them into the soup. Do you have to do this? No, but I love the smokiness that it adds because it's an extra level of oomph that you would normally not get. And so guys, I'm going to be doing this over a broiler or under a broiler, excuse me. A broiler is your top heating element of the oven. It's meant for really, really quick, rapid cooking so that you could go ahead and develop a bunch of color on something. But yes, charring uh, in Algerian cooking, you see charring a lot in Middle Eastern cooking as well, especially like Turkish cooking. Uh, you have like charred tomatoes and like charred peppers and you typically discard the skin, but I'm going to be using up the skins. I'm not gonna be discarding it, right? So I have this aluminum foil that I really, really need to uh, figure out what's going on with it because it's, um, 
at the moment, how do I say it? It's a little messed up. It's a little messed up at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my aluminum foil guys, it's all messed up. Please help me. Please, how do I fix this? Chat, how do I, how do I fix this problem? Uh-oh. My aluminum foil. <gasps> okay, I did, I think I dislodged it. Ugh, oh, it's the worst. Okay, <gasps> did I just make it worse? I think I might've just made it worse, guys. Uh-oh. No, save me. This is absolutely obnoxious. This is awful. What the hell do I do about this? I don't really wanna dig it up with my nail because, well, you know. <gasps> okay, okay, we're getting somewhere. Chat, my little sous chefs, I believe we've done it. Ah, oh, amazing. We have cleaned up my tin foil. My aluminum foil, rather. Is it a difference between tin foil and aluminum foil? I don't think so. Okay, let's go ahead and get a nice fresh sheet of aluminum foil, and I'm just going to be going ahead and setting this onto my sheet tray. Um, and so I'm just doing this so that cleanup is a little bit easier later on, although I should probably get into the habit of not doing that and just washing it because aluminum foil is not particularly good for the environment or anything. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this away now. And now guys, let's go ahead and char up some of the components for today's soup. Um, again, I take a lot of inspiration for Mexican cooking and this is one of my favorite techniques. You don't have to use a broiler. You could theoretically just take like a cast iron or any steel pan, heat it up, and you wanna keep the tomatoes whole. But we wanna get the tomatoes nice and flat so that they lay flat on my sheet tray. So guys, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to make a nice incision lengthwise through each of my tomatoes. I'm using plum tomatoes. I'm using plum tomatoes because they're really, really cheap. Okay, these are gonna get blended down. Plum tomatoes aren't typically super flavorful, but they have a lot of flesh. I'm making some diagonal incisions now that I've cut them in half to cut the core out. I hate it when I see people cut the core out using a pel uh, pelling knife and they dig into it. I think this method, diagonal incision, diagonal incision, so much easier. Ready? Diagonal incision, diagonal incision. Beautiful, couple more to go. Diagonal, diagonal, excellent, and Diagonal, diagonal, lovely. So guys, let's go ahead and just get my uh, tomatoes onto my sheet tray now. And the goal isn't for us to particularly cook the tomato or anything. All I'm really looking to do at this stage is to get them charred. I'm looking to get them intentionally burnt. Everybody, I want you to start thinking, especially when you're making chilies. In fact, we're also going to do one of my suganos uh, as well. We're basically almost like starting a salsa here, right? I really, really want you to think about the different places that you could char things like tomatoes and peppers. They take to charring exceptionally well. I think it's something that everybody would really, really benefit from. Also, Karate Kuba, 37 months subscribed. Karate Kuba was one of the OGs. Hello, hello. So guys, here's my one Serrano chili. The others I'm just gonna saute, not do anything crazy with, okay? So three plum tomatoes. Two Suganos. And by the way, this is why I like working with fresh tomatoes, not canned tomatoes. Canned tomatoes, they're too wet to actually char. They don't have the skin attached. When they're uh, fresh tomatoes like this, we can go ahead and char the skin properly. So guys, I'm gonna go ahead and throw this under the broiler now. And we're going to get all of those skins really nice and beautifully smoky. We're looking for them to be charred. We're looking for them to turn black. We're looking for them to get that smoky. Um, and in the meantime, we can go ahead and proceed with the rest of the prep. So, at the moment, tomatoes in the broiler, my chicken pieces inside of the pressure cooker pot itself. We're making the stock for the soup. We're making the tomato base for the soup itself. And also, control F U. thank you so much for the prime sub. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and have a little sip of water. Mm. That's right, we do have a hype train. Wow. Okay, guys. So let's think about the other kinds of prep that we need to get done and out of the way. I want chunks of carrot in today's soup. I want chunks of carrot. I want chunks of celery as well. I want this to be a very vegetable forward, very vegetable heavy soup today. Also, Blue C, thank you so much for this up. Thank you, thank you. You guys are so sweet to me today. I really appreciate it. Um, so guys, let's go ahead and begin with that. Also, for those of you that haven't already done so, check out my Patreon, cough, cough, cough. And so, here is what I actually want to do. I want to have a duality of textures of carrot inside of today's soup. I want chunks of carrot, but then I also want some aromatic carrot that gets saute. So I want some carrot to basically get so soft that it almost breaks down in the soup. So one of it I'm going to chop up super, super finely, and the rest of them I'm going to chunk up nice and big, right? And so this is something I really like doing. We get a duality of textures. We get two different expressions of the carrot. We get some more of like those sweet flavors. 
Um, some of like the more robust ones uh, by sauteing it. And then by boiling it, we have a really nice proper root vegetable uh, for us to bite into. But what will need to happen no matter what is I wanna go ahead and peel these carrots. You don't really have to peel them as long as you scrub them, um, but I just happen to like the way they look more when they're peeled because the skin isn't very aesthetically pleasing. I would also say you could use the carrot peels for a stock, but I would only add it at the end of a stock. And the reason for that is because the carrot peels are so thin that they'll easily overcook. And if they overcook, you're going to basically get a sort of dirty looking stock. So that's why I didn't add my carrot peels into the pressure cooker itself. If I was doing it in a pot, I would add it to like the last 20 minutes of cook time. Does everybody get it? Can I please get it, yes, chef? I wanna make sure that you understand my reasoning as to why. So guys, nice, big, beautiful peels using my vegetable peeler all the way through this bad boy. And I'm just going to go ahead and clean him up. Okay. And that's most of it. And it's okay if there's a little bit of skin left over. I just wanna keep myself busy. There we go. Lovely. But yeah, again, you don't necessarily have to. Um, I'm just doing this for funsies. But also if you like didn't do like a very good job of scrubbing them. With root vegetables, you do have to thoroughly scrub them, right? Because they grow in soil, they're covered in dirt. Right? You don't know where they've been. And so I just gave them a light wash, but I didn't like heavily scrub them today. All right, and let's go ahead and get that last one all taken care of. There you go, there you go, almost done. And let's just go ahead and quickly just clean up this end. Okie dokie. So that's all of my carrots nicely and beautifully peeled. One of them is going to be getting the fine chop treatment. I'm going to be doing that to this one because this is going to be part of my aromatics. This is going to be part of my mirepoix. And then the other two I'm going to be chunking up. So guys, let's talk about what a mirepoix is. A mirepoix is a French word for an aromatic trinity that is oftentimes used in a lot of different cooking. This combination of carrots, onions, and celery are contextual to so many different cuisines. Do you have to use carrots, onions, and celery for the soup today? No. Why am I using it? It's because that I have it at home. Carrots, they add a very nice, like, really robust sweetness. The celery adds a really nice herbaceousness, and the onions have that aromatic allium quality to it. And so all I'm going to do, guys, is I'm just going to go ahead and take Mr. Carrot and I'm going to just be slicing him into planks, nice thin planks, thin, thin, thin planks, just like so. Okay, right, nice long planks. And I'm gonna be doing the same exact thing to this other one. So I'm first squaring it off, getting a nice flat side. And now I can cut them up into planks. And again, the idea is we want this to be chopped up super finely so that it basically dissolves into the soup itself as it actually cooks. Also, big gorilla hands. Thank you so much for the sub. So guys, and now I'm going to go ahead and take my carrot. Right now you can see that we've lined all of them up. I'm going to go ahead and just cut him up into some matchsticks, nice and thin. The thinner, the better for this. You wanna have a nice, sharp, sharp knife, guys. Okay, so take a look. Look at these matchsticks. Ready, we're going through all of them. We're getting it done. And don't walk away from the broiler. Don't forget that we have the tomatoes in there. So I'm gonna finish the carrots and then we'll take a look at the tomatoes. We're looking again for the outside skin of both the serrano and the tomatoes to be fully and properly charred. So guys, take a look. We have all of these beautiful matchsticks of carrot now. I'm making sure to keep them lined up just like this. And now I'm going to go ahead and give them a little bit of a turn, right? And now what is the goal? The goal is for us to get this all into super, super small cubes. I know like this looks like a lot of work, but I actually think it's worth the effort because the goal is to infuse this carrot. The reason we don't puree it, the reason we don't put in a food processor is because it crushes it so much that I don't think it's going to effectively saute if we do that. So guys, take a look. Oh, look at this diced carrot. I don't think I've ever diced a carrot this finely. Guys, I think I did a really good job with this today. Look at this. But yeah, a food processor, a grater, you could theoretically use them for accessibility reasons. Um, but guys, I just find that they're a little too rough. They crush the outside of it. They make the carrot release a lot more moisture. Chef, how do you practice slicing vegetables until you're consistent? Do I just cook with badly chopped vegetables for a while until they skill up? Yes, you just do. And the reason for this is because even if you don't have perfectly chopped vegetables, at the end of the day, your product is going to still be fine. It might even just be good or excellent. Because... Proper knife skills aren't a make or break. They will not make or break this dish. 
okay? Because it's a soup at the end of the day. So the reality is this, it's a spectrum. You get a gradient of, you know, how refined it is. But at the end of the day, even if you have poorly chopped carrots, it's not going to uh, be the end of the world. Okay, so guys, I'm going to go ahead and now take a little peek on my, uh, at my tomatoes. Again, we're looking for them to get nicely and beautifully and properly charred. So let's go ahead and inspect them and see how they're doing. And guys, I actually think that this is ready to go for us. Take a look. All of my tomato skins, all of my Serrano skins, they've been properly charred. And now we're just going to go ahead and let them cool off. Once they've cooled off, we're going to be blending them down. And that is going to be one of our main components of flavor for today's soup. Okay, so look at these carrots. Guys, do you see how well I cut these carrots? Look at these bad boys. Look at these. Oh my goodness. I'm pretty proud of myself. That was a very nicely chopped carrot, I must say. Good job, darling. Giving myself a little pat, dare I say, on the back. Whoa. Okay, dokie. So let's go ahead, guys, and let's just get this into a nice big bowl. And this is where we're going to be adding in the onions as well as the celery that we cut up. So again, we have two, we're doing vegetables two ways. We have the chunks that we actually want to bite into, and then we have the super small chunks that we want to actually flavor the soup with instead. Okay, so let's just go ahead and now move on to the celery. I'm gonna be doing the same exact thing with the celery, guys. I'm going to be taking one stick of celery here, and I'm just going to be taking it, and I'm going to cut this up into semi-even lengths. And now I'm going to just go ahead and cut this bad boy into, how do I want to cut this into planks? Do I want to just do this and then cut into planks? Yeah, I think that's the easiest way to do it. So I'm not going to follow the actual groove of the celery itself. So again, we're just cutting into planks and then we'll cut into batons and then into little tiny cubes. That beep was the pressure cooker telling us it's ready to go and that my chicken stock is now officially going at the moment. Does anybody have any questions for me uh, while this is happening? And plank it up and plank it up. Just get it all going, guys. Beautiful. So these are now my celery planks. You theoretically, at this stage, you also don't really have to cut it into batons. I just think it's really nice for us to do. And I'm also enjoying the process of doing the vegetables today. So same exact idea as the celery, guys. I'm taking this and into batons, parallel to the first cut, right? Into these lovely little matchsticks now. Beautiful. Look at that. Guys, look at the knife skills today. I don't mean to brag, but I think I'm doing a very good job with them. Mmm. And we're going to do the same exact thing, nice and thin, all the way through, until we obtain all of my celery ready to go. Okay, there we go, guys. And now we're going to do the same exact thing. We're going to go ahead and just cut these up into little tiny cubes. So let's stack them up. Let's give them a nice 90 degree rotation. And now small little tiny dices. Ready? And all of this, guys, is going to melt into the soup itself. It's going to contribute so much beautiful flavor. Very nice. Ooh, look at that. And you would know, yeah, you would with the tag like knives. Thank you. Bonjour, madame, how are you? Hello, Meek. Hello, hello, it's lovely to see you. Hope you're having a beautiful day today. I'm doing quite well myself, I have to say. Okay, guys, so the celery, that is now just about ready to go as well. Let's go ahead and now scoop it up and put it in alongside the carrots. Again, the super, super small dice, it's going to contribute into the soup itself. It's basically going to melt in. It's going to get some beautiful color. The reason why I'm not using a food processor, aside from the fact that I feel like this is a fairly insignificant amount of vegetables to use a food processor for, is because of the fact that if I do use one, also, wait a second, I think my air conditioner isn't working because I have the heating on. <gasps> Gasp! Guys, I'm so sorry. I'm going to be back in a second, I promise. I'm not going to forget about you. Yes, I do have my heater on. Oh no, I have like central cooling and so simultaneously having AC and, and heater does not work. So that's bad for the machine, it can't do that. Okay, I think we should be okay now. Ah, that was a little bit silly of me. Okay, let's see. So everybody, so what have we done so far? We got all of my beautiful carrots and my celery nicely prepped and ready to go for actual sauteing. We have the chicken broth going as well simultaneously. We have the tomatoes and the chilies charred. And now it's time for us to process Mr. Onion. We have a nice big onion because guys, guess what? I don't think you can have too many onions in life. 
Okay, so one of them, again, we're going to be cutting one of them up into big chunks because I'm going to want big pieces of onion. And then I'm also going to want some that really, really melt into the soup. Is everybody paying attention? I want to hear the nice who's on and yes, chef, please and thank you. And garlic, we'll get to garlic in a second, except we're just going to be separating the garlic. I'm doing the mirepoix at the moment, just so that we can, um, you know, get like that full base and the uh, garlic is going to be added later on. Okay. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and peel up this onion now. Now that we've cut it in half and we're keeping the root end of it actually attached. And guys, you can't really have too much onion in life. Onions are one of my favorite, if not favorite vegetables of all time. Okay. I'm just cleaning up my station to get rid of any sort of remaining onion skins that could be laying around. I'm going to also switch out my gloves because I wanna adjust my hair and maybe even tie it up at the moment. Um, also, I don't mind uh, Madame. I think that's fine, Moonha. So thank you for that, but Madame is fine. Okay. I think it's like sweet, it's very, okay. So my hair is tied up. I don't know if this looks good at the moment, but we're just going to have to roll with it. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and glove up once more just to protect my dainty little eczema ridden paws. It's not easy having eczema. You don't have to have, by the way, gloves uh, if you're cooking at home. I just do it especially with acidic things or really wet things just so that I um, you know, keep them nice and protected. Okay, so I'm just wiping off my knife, making sure that it's staying nice and clean. I have my waste bowl here also ready to go as needed. And now guys, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through this and we're making a bunch of parallel incisions. But first, you know what? Let's just cut this onion in half. That's gonna make my life easier and I'm gonna show you exactly why. So guys, root end attached, onion going this way. What we're doing, we're going through here and we're making a bunch of really, really thin parallel incisions. So this is not the same as the carrots and celery, okay? So take a look. And now we have developed the onion fan. The one and only. And now we're going to give this bad boy a little bit of a quarter turn now that we've cut him like this. And guys, take a look at what happens. Now we have a super onion fan. It's basically an onion brush now, right? And now we get a really, really nice, beautifully done, thin, thin dice all the way through. And let's just go ahead and wipe off with a knife, make sure my station never gets too cluttered or anything. And the onion, by the way, has to be like the least perfect of all the vegetables. The onion is the one that does end up breaking down the most. So I'm not like too concerned with the onion being perfect, but we're still going to give it a lot of effort anyways. So guys, take a look. All of that onion, my onion fan, lovely. Let's get rid of the root end. And now, before we actually proceed to the second part of it, let's just go ahead and clean up our station, guys. Clean up our knife. And we're gonna go ahead and take Mr. Bench Scraper. Okay? And all we're going to do is we're just going to scoop everything up and into the bowl. If you do not own a Bench Scraper, I highly, highly recommend investing in one. Guys, this is something that I picked up in restaurants a long time ago. It was one of the best purchases to actually have at home. It is such a useful, useful tool. It makes your life so much easier. Is that clear? Please do. It's cheap. You can get, you, it doesn't really matter which one you get. Just get a metal one, not like a plastic one, and it will treat you well. So guys, same exact idea. We're building the onion fan, the one and only onion fan. And now we go down here and we make some parallel incisions once more. We get the onion brush, and now we go ahead and get our lovely little small dies. Beautiful. And again, these vegetables, the whole idea of them is for them to contribute into the soup itself. You might be asking me, why am I doing such fine vegetables? I want these to saute. The reason I don't do a food processor is because it's so much less sharp and precise than a knife that you end up crushing the vegetables, and when you crush them, okay, when you crush them, they release a lot more water as they cook. It's a lot more difficult to actually get them to brown properly. That's not me saying that you can't do it. I just think the optimal product is hand chopped. But if you are doing a lot of this at once, guys, just do a food processor. Do a food processor, do whatever it is that you would like. Okay, you can even use a, like a grater, like my grandma does, although grating onions is uh, a disaster. Like it just produces so much of that like, pungency. Okay. So guys, guess what? We have officially done the vegetables. My aromatic base, right, has now been completed. So this is my carrots, this is my onions, this is my celery. I put them all into the same bowl because I'm going to be adding all of them in at the same time. We're going to be cooking it down in fat. We're going to be basically melting it in and it's going to be amazing. Now, let's go ahead and do some of the other vegetable prep that we need to get done for today. So we have the other carrots. And guys, I want nice, nice, delicious big chunks of carrot. 
okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a carrot, and this is how you get an evenly cut carrot. As you may notice, everybody tap in. I wanna make sure that you're listening. I wanna hear a nice yes, chef. Please and thank you. A carrot is not even in its width. This one's a little bit more even, actually, but a carrot is not very typically even in its width. This is what a carrot looks like, right? Thick to thin, it tapers off. And so here's what we actually do to compensate for that. We do, I forgot the actual name of this cut. There's a Japanese name for it. Uh, I just call it a rolling cut. So here's what we do. We start off right here, and we're going to go ahead and take a chunk of carrot. And then I give it a 90 degree turn, and I give it another cut, and I give it another cut. And as I go, I'm making them slightly bigger than the last one to compensate for the smaller width. So as I'm going, I'm going and I'm slightly increasing the angle on my knife until you see how long these pieces are compared to this. And now these are roughly all going to cook at around the same time. So that's what I call a rolling cut. Right? And so, do you have to do this? Could you just chop this up into coins? Yeah, but I'm looking for chunks of carrot today. Right? So again, basically like almost a coin, almost a coin, and the further I go down, the more aggressive my angle on these is. Okay? The more I go down, the more aggressive my angle, and then the last one just gets cut up into two pieces. And that way, we have relatively evenly cut up carrots. Let's go ahead and get that transferred over to a bowl as well. So two carrots, these were two small to medium sized carrots. Again, you can use as many or as little as you would like. Uh, I was just sort of imagining the texture for the soup and I really wanted a nice soft carrot to bite into. Um, I don't love biting into celery that much, but here's what I always do, especially because of the fact that I'm not really processing the celery, guys. To get rid of the fibers from a piece of celery, you just crack off the bottom and then you basically peel it. And what you are left with is these super, super tough fibers. And we're going to do the same exact thing to the other one. We take it, we crack it, and we peel it. We take it, we crack it, and we peel it. We get rid of these super, super tough fibers, and our celery is going to be a lot more tender as a result. And so now, guys, I'm going to just go ahead and cut this up as well. Um, these are the kinds of pieces I'm thinking about for my celery. I don't want them to be too big. I don't love biting into celery that much, but I'm getting adjusted to it. So again, also guys, it's a soup. If it's not perfect, it's fine because it's a soup at the end of the day, all right? You don't have to go as crazy as I am about all my knife techniques for it. I just happen to like doing so. And then we also have the second half of the onion. So let's not forget about him. And I also would like some nice big, big, big chunks of onion in today's soup, guys. So we have the vegetables that are gonna melt in. That's for the sake of the broth. And then we actually have the vegetables that we're going to be eating. Right, so we have this really nice duality. So we're going to be basically fanning it out the same way, except not nearly as many incisions, right? And these are the cuts I'm looking for on my onions. Annoyed we do, it's a new addition. Guys, do you like the sub badges? Do you like the sub badges? I'm really proud of them. We had this amazing artist, Luminovia. She did a wonderful, wonderful job for us. Okay, and that's all of my lovely little onion guys. Let's go ahead and also get him into the same bowl. Excellent. Okay, there we go. So guys, my onion, my carrot, my celery, these are the bites uh, that we'll actually be biting into. And then this is my carrots, onions, and celery that will be the mirepoix. That's going to be the really delicious aromatic base of today. Let's go ahead and get the tomatoes and chilies all blended up now that we have a second to do so. So guys, I'm just going to set up a little bit of a blender station. I'm going to grab a cutting board for stability and we grab the blender and we set him up right over here. Excellent. And let's plug him in. And now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and pick up every single one of my, um, my little tomatoes, my chilies, and we're going to go ahead and throw him in here. So again, you did not have to actually char it. You didn't have to go out of your way to do so. Um, the reason why I did it is because I wanted to have something really nice and smoky, right? I wanted to get that smoky flavor out of it. I'm really oftentimes inspired by Mexican cooking and this idea of charring the vegetables uh, is very much so uh, in this specific way used all the time in Mexican food. So guys, I'm taking the plum tomatoes and I'm just throwing it into my blender cup, throwing it inside. And I'm throwing in my two serranos as well, throwing it inside skins and all. Because again, the goal was not to get these things cooked through. The goal was to get that smoky, delicious flavor developed. Okay. And so now all that we're going to do, we're going to pop on the blender itself. And let's go ahead and get this going until it's all beautifully processed. Let's get it going. 
And this is what's going to go into the soup. It's going to be lovely. It's going to give it some viscosity for today as well so that it's not completely running. Okay? Does anybody have any questions for me? Also, as a general safety tip, by the way, because this is a Nutribullet, um, you have to make sure that your things cool down before you put them inside. That's why we let them cool down a little bit. Uh, chef, is a blender necessary for this recipe? Noid, it is not. You could alternatively also finely chop up the tomatoes. You can use an emulsion blender. You can use a food processor. I'm using a blender because I don't want any chunks of tomato. You could also just finely chop up a tomato. Okay? Um, and I'm not going to strain it, so the seeds will be fine. Um, let's get this a little bit finer, though. I want to get all the skins ground. A little bit finer. Get it going a little bit longer, guys. That should be good. And now, guys, these are my pureed, delicious, beautifully charred tomatoes. Meek, you said that you wish you could cook like me? Ask me cooking questions. That's the way to do it. The way that you cook like me. So let me, let me talk to you guys about something. Let me brag for a second here, okay? I consider myself pretty okay at cooking. I consider myself quite good. The reason why I got good at cooking, and it took me a very long time. I wasn't very efficient with it. I wouldn't even say that I even got good at cooking until I was 17 years old. So that was four years ago. So from 7 to 17, I was cooking. I was basically absorbing information from a lot of different places. But what I think made me a, a, what it means to actually cook like me was the fact that I asked a lot of questions. There is a lot of nonsense in the food world. People misuse the word emulsify and mild reaction left and right. People say extract flavor, seal this and seal that. It is oftentimes misused. The way that you cook like me is by questioning everything during your learning process. You can ask me questions, by the way. I'm a really good resource. You can ask me anything that you want. It can be super small and technical. It can be big and vast. It can be philosophical about food. The way that you get good at anything, especially something like cooking, is to just question everything until you understand why you're doing what you do. You have to build up feel. And you don't build up feel by learning how to do something. You learn why you're doing something. You don't just learn how to chop an onion, you understand the relevance of it. And so, right, that's why I talk about like the different amounts of effort, right? The reason we chopped these up super finely was because I wanted them to cook faster and to melt in. The reason I didn't use a food processor is because it crushes it too much and it makes it release more water. The reason why I have these chunked up instead is because I want them big enough for us to bite in. So I have a rationale and I have an explanation for why I'm doing every single thing, right? And that is how you can cook like me just by asking, asking yourself, asking yourself, question literally everything that you possibly can. So guys, at the moment, my veggies here are done. My tomato puree is also done. I'm just going to go ahead and set all of this stuff behind me and get that ready to go for us later on. Um, I have this kale here that I just want to quickly process up. This is some now old and stale kale. What am I making a lasagna? That's going to be a long stream because I would want to do the bolognese. I would want to do the, you know, everything from scratch if I'm doing a lasagna. But I love doing baked pastas. Just lasagnas are a lot of effort. They're a lot of love. So guys, I'm just taking my kale off the stem here. The kale is going to be one of the last additions into the soup itself. Why am I using it? Uh, well, because I already had some. Also, Shark Dog, thank you so much for the prime sub. Chef, what do I do if all I know is breathing and fine dining? Uh, Natalie, I don't know what you're asking me. I'm sorry. Also, by the way, is everybody still tapped in? I want to make sure that you're also listening. I want to hear a nice yes chef from everybody watching. And you can ask me any and all cooking questions that you may have. But yeah, the reason why I haven't done a lasagna on stream is because I don't consider it the most practical in terms of home cooking. It's a lot of effort to make a good one. There's a lot of mediocre lasagnas using, you know, garbage quality Galbani ricotta cheese, no baked noodles, dried sauce. But if I'm doing a lasagna, I'd be doing it with love and effort. And love and effort is maybe too time consuming for a dish like that. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and just slice this up into little ribbons. And I love kale in soups like this as well. Really nice vegetable. But the fact is that kale is so curly and it has so much texture that it does a really good job of picking up the soup. Whereas other vegetables are smooth and like the broth slides off of it. The beauty of kale is in its coarseness, is in its roughness, my friends. So embrace that texture. Add it to soups. I don't love raw kale that much, but cooked kale like this, oh. You can't really beat it. So I'm going to once again use my bench scraper and just scoop that up onto a plate. And guys, what I'm trying to exhibit here is the importance of getting all of you prep done ahead of time. You get you prep done ahead of time and then you have nothing to worry about after, okay? Okie dokie. So let's go ahead and actually begin the process of sauteing my vegetables. 
So I'm gonna be doing this all in a nice, beautiful Dutch oven, and we'll talk about why and what we're doing and how to use this thing. I need everybody to tap into this because we're about to go on a lecture. We're about to go on a rant. This is one of the, tap in, yes yeah, chef, please and thank you. This is one of the most misused and abused kitchen tools I've ever seen. The humble Dutch oven, the Le Creuset Dutch oven. So everybody, we're going to talk about this thing and we're going to talk about why we're using this tool and we're going to talk about its function and its beauty and where people go wrong with it. First of all, an enamel Dutch oven, you essentially have cast iron, really, really thick cast iron, which is, and the beauty of cast iron is it's able to hold it in a lot of heat and it's able to keep things warm for an extended amount of time. You add something to cast iron and it doesn't immediately cool down because it's so thick and heavy. Second thing about it, it is enameled. It is enameled, I believe, with a certain type of glass that is now bonded to the pan itself. So, what does that mean? People think, people think that just because this is cast iron, that they could go ahead and take metal tools to it, that they think they can take it and crank it up all the way. That's not just cast iron, that's enameled cast iron. You have to treat this thing gently. You have to treat this thing like a nonstick pan that can hold in a lot more heat. So the first rule is this. We never blast it with a high heat. The high heat would be, first of all, bad for um, building up actual hot spots in the pan itself. So we're going to get a bunch of hot spots and a bunch of cool spots. It's not going to heat it evenly. Second of all, you're going to damage that coating over time by blasting it with heat. So the way that you do this, the way to get it really hot is to heat it up over medium for a long amount of time. You heat it up on high over a short amount of time and it won't evenly heat up medium and a long amount of time and the whole thing is gonna get nice and hot. Is that clear? Second of all, no metal tools. Think about this thing as a nonstick pan. You use metal tools, you will damage that inner coating. You will damage that inner enamel. I see, oh my God, all kinds of professional chefs on YouTube, online, in the food content creation sphere that take a metal whisk to the Dutch oven. Abuse, that is, that is terrible. They destroy the insides of it. They get all of like this uh, spotting on the inside. They damage the coating over time. It's absolutely ridiculous. Treat this thing gently medium heat over a long period of time, make sure that you're using wooden tools, and then your cast iron Dutch oven is going to take care of you. If it's not enamel, then it's a straight up Dutch oven, then you can go ahead and be a little bit rougher with it. But this is my luck crusade. This thing is going to go ahead and last a while. Guys, treat your tools gently with the respect that they deserve, okay? And this is one of those tools that people think they can be really rough with. Treat them well, and they will treat you well back. Heat it up on medium of a long amount of time, and nothing is gonna stick. The reason why people get stickage on enamel Dutch oven is because they blast it with heat. And they think, oh, I heat it up on high for a minute, so it's hot. But no, you've developed hot spots and cool spots. So even if it looks like your oil is smoking, you have cool spots where the food actually ends up sticking. Heating it up slowly gives you an even heat. It is one of the biggest mistakes that you could possibly make. People think that cast iron is a bad conductor. No, you just do not heat it up enough. Okay. So that's my Dutch oven rant. We haven't used these in a while and they do come with the manual. Le Creuset's do come with the manual. They do say some of these things in there as well. So guys, I am here to teach you what, how to treat these things gently. Also, by the way, heating it up with oil and water is also pretty good practice because it does um, you know, the oil is almost like a buffer. It helps to make sure that it's also heating evenly, right? Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and just swirl the oil around. Uh, it also helps to us to prevent hot spots. So I like to heat up oil alongside the Dutch oven itself. Okay, and so I'm already just setting up my coaster station, right? Just getting that ready to go for us whenever we need it. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of a little something. One second, guys. Okay, my coaster station. And I'm going to make sure that I have a nice, beautiful wooden spoon, wooden or silicone only, right? No metal tools, unless you're just picking something up, but no scraping allowed. Okay. So everybody, here is the order of operation for the soup itself. We still have the meat uh, for today's soup to actually cook. We still have the chicken pieces. And so here's what's going to need to happen. All right, we're going to first start off by sauteing my aromatics. Right here, I have, of course, my beautiful onions, carrots, and celery. So let's talk about this really quickly. Uh, should the wooden spoon be rounded to minimize damage? No, you can just do any wooden spoon that you possibly have. 
So guys, let's talk about why we're doing the things that we're doing. First thing that we're doing is we're sauteing these vegetables. One of the biggest issues that I see in the world of food writing and recipes and food content is they say, oh, just saute them for two minutes in oil. In two minutes, you will absolutely have no development of flavor whatsoever besides some mild infusion into the oil itself. So what are we doing? We're first softening the vegetables and causing them to collapse. When they collapse, they release liquid. When the liquid is released, that prevents it from browning. We then evaporate the liquid that was released from the carrots, onions, and celery, and then we're able to then finally slowly begin browning it. The process of sauteing vegetables takes above all else, it takes time. It takes time and you have to be patient with it. If your goal is just to have a boiled soup, you don't have to do the step, guys. You could theoretically just boil everything and it will still be delicious. But if you want to have a little bit more oomph, if you want a little bit more robust flavor, we're sauteing the vegetables properly in a good amount of oil. The oil is going to stop it from burning on the bottom. The oil is going to make sure that the vegetables are enveloped in the heat itself. Do I have any tips for taking care of wood and utensils? Uh, cactus, the only thing is I wouldn't submerge them, but I put all of mine in the dishwasher and they're fine. I've had mine forever and they're fine. Uh, just don't submerge them because that can cause them to crack, okay? Um, so I just immediately go from, you know, when it's done to immediately to the dishwasher and it seems to be okay. So guys, we don't need this olive oil to be like smoking or anything. We're just heating it up nice and slow on that medium heat, guys. We're letting it go, we're letting it do its thing. And again, slowly but surely, if you have your oil too hot in the beginning, you're going to end up sort of charring the outside of it before we actually begin the caramelization. We need to do this in a three-step cooking process. Collapse, evaporate, brown. It's fine if there's some browning in the beginning, but we're not really looking for it to brown in the beginning, okay? So, my oil, I would say, is now properly heated up. Again, I don't need this to be uh, particularly smoking hot or anything. I just need it to be hot enough that we can begin the collapse of my lovely vegetables. So my carrots, my onions, my celery, we have a really nice sizzle going in. And let's go ahead and just scoop out all of this so that we have no waste whatsoever. I'm going to just switch off the spatula I'm using just so that I can get a bit of an easier scrape on this. And again, this is not the stage where things can burn unless you just don't have enough oil. This is not the stage where things begin to burn. So don't worry about it. It's going to collapse. It's going to release its water. Everybody, how do you know if you're sauteing versus boiling? It's all in the sound. You hear the high end pss that's cooking in oil. You're going to hear that high end pss shortly be replaced with a lower end psh. When you hear that psh, that is the water being released from the vegetables themselves. It's combining with the oil, it's making the whole pan cloudy, and it's not getting any color. So we have to cook this thoroughly and for a good time. So guys, we're first mixing it around. Why are we mixing it around? We're mixing it around to make sure that the oil is properly enveloping each vegetable. Make sure that you don't have significant amounts of vegetables stuck to the sides of your pan. The vegetables that are stuck to the sides of the pot are the ones that end up burning because they're not immersed in oil anymore. So get them all nice and flat, get them all distributed. And again, we're just doing this on a low, medium heat. Our goal is not to build up color at the stage. Our goal is to collapse them. So let's go ahead and proceed with everything else that we actually need for them. Um, we're going to go ahead and get Mr. Garlic all nice and processed. So I have a bunch of garlic cloves. You're late to the stream, that's okay, Ali. It's lovely to have you nonetheless. So guys, again, this is the stage where we can walk away and you can hear that sound. With less of a high end pss, a little bit of a lower end psh sound. So guys, I have three garlic cloves right here. I have these three bad boys. Just gonna go ahead and clean up my station. And all we're going to do, guys, we're going to give them a little press, a little press toe. Ugh, that wasn't good. Ignore that. And why do we give it a little press? We're going to go ahead. Oh, you can hear that sound. Again, it's changing, it's changing. I'm just going to give it a little stir just to make sure that there is everything covered in that oil nice and evenly. Okay, that everything is cooking up nice and evenly. We'll also salt it in a little bit. Guys, this is the aromatic base that we need for today's soup, and it's going to make it delicious. Okay, last one. And let's go ahead and give it a little smash. And it does smell great. It's delicious olive oil. And so let's also talk about the oil that we use. I highly recommend using a tasty fat. I'm not using butter because butter burns a little bit too easily for something like this. But when I say tasty fat, I mean something like olive oil, something like an animal fat, something like butter. And why do I call these tasty fats? Well, the other kinds of fats are neutral oils. Peanut oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, whatsoever. They range from being completely bland to not having any taste whatsoever. By cooking this with olive oil, we at least get to go ahead and get the delicious flavor of olive oil into the rest of the dish. 
okay? Because your fat, your oil, is as much of an ingredient as everything else is. The fat is not just a lubricant. The fat doesn't just help things to cook. The fat is as much of an ingredient. So Audio Murphy, you said bacon fat. Bacon fat would be delicious in something like this. Bacon fat, if you have any on hand, would make for an excellent, excellent addition. So guys, I'm just trimming off the dried off ends of the garlic. Again, your fat is as much of an ingredient as everything else is in the dish. Guys, now that the pan is slowly beginning to dry up a little bit, I'm just giving everything a stir. I'm making sure that nothing is scorching. I'm stirring it, and I'm just making sure to lift some of the vegetables off from the bottom. Okay, I'm lifting them off. I'm lifting them off, and we're just letting them do their thing. We're being nice and patient, guys. It's going to take a little bit of time, so we want to be patient. We want to give them a lot of love. We want to give them a lot of attention, a lot of effort, okay? A yes chef is an order, please and thank you. So, let's go ahead and get Mr. Garlic Press out and ready to go. I have him right over there. So, again, I cannot stand chopping garlic for the life of me. Chopping garlic is an absolute waste of time. I just use my garlic press. The finer that you mince it and crush it, the easier it is, or uh, the more of that allison, the more of that pungency you develop. But I cannot stand, cannot stand chopping garlic. I don't know why people are saying yes chef, but I do love the fact that you guys are I don't I guys, I want you to say yes, chef, sometimes when I don't even necessarily tell you to. That's the ultimate goal. Okay? The ultimate goal, I don't want you guys just to say yes, chef, whenever I tell you to. I want you guys to start it whenever they give you a command. Okay? That's how we build up the kitchen hierarchy. A hierarchy is important sometimes. Makes me feel special about myself. Makes it all parasocial, so you guys give me more money. I'm kidding, I'm messing with you. Well, I'm self-aware, but I'm uh, enabling. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just grab a little knife. And I'm going to just go ahead and just go ahead and quickly just scrape this off. Beautiful. Now let's get all of that garlic inside. All that crushed garlic. Nicely done. Also, meat. Thank you so much for the sub. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, let's go ahead and now stir up my vegetables. And now, guys, we can hear that pss, they might be squelching at the bottom. And again, that's why we do a nice low-medium heat here, okay? We give them all a nice, really beautiful flip, a nice, beautiful, simple flip skis, and let them continue to be on their way into vegetable sauté them. And again, I'm just using my smaller spatula just to dislodge any of the ones that could be stuck to the sides of the pan. Now that we've hit this stage, guys, the vegetables have properly collapsed. They've significantly reduced in volume, and this is where they can go ahead and start developing and building some color. I'm going to go ahead and run my brush under some water, just so that I can go ahead and poke out the uh, garlic that is stuck inside of it. Okay? And I'm just gonna go ahead and throw that into my dishwasher while I have a second to do so. Beautiful, okay. Um, so what, what do you specifically have difficulty with cactus? What do you, uh, tell me what you have difficulty with. I'm getting hungry. How much longer? Ali, it's going to be a while today. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay, guys, the vegetables, they're really, really starting to build up that beautiful color. Again, try to avoid getting anything on the sides of this pot. We're roasting the vegetables now, right? We're getting some of that really, really beautiful color, some of that really, really beautiful flavor developed as well. Let's go ahead and start hitting these bad boys with a little bit of salt. And again, this is the stage in the process where you do have to start stirring them a little bit more often. If you neglect to stir them in now, they're going to start squelching on the bottom. So guys, we gotta move fast, we gotta move fast. Let's go ahead and prep some of my other chilies because I wanted some spice in today's soup. So I have two more serranos that I was planning on using. I'm just gonna go ahead and clean up my station really quickly. And I'm just going to go ahead and trim off the heads of my serrano chili. And let's go ahead and just get this cut up into really nice thin coins. Right? I want some spice. I want some real heat in today's soup, guys. And I'm not using a glove, which is a mistake that I will 100% end up regretting. But that's okay. So let's go ahead and give this a little stir. Oh, and guys, remember how I talked about it? it can start charring on the bottom. I just saw the bottoms of those vegetables begin to blacken ever so slightly. We do not walk away for too long, okay? So we stir it up. We don't need too much fat in here. They're doing a really, really wonderful job of browning up on their own. And I'm going to slightly lower the heat now because it does not need that much more heat to just go ahead and get this job done. 
And this is going to be the delicious, delicious base of today's soup. Chef, how would you describe uh, something having a smoky flavor? Well, hold on. How do I describe a smoky flavor? Have you had barbecue? Have you had bacon? I'm not really sure how to describe smoky flavor other than smoke, right? It smells like a bit of a campfire. It smells like a uh, barbecue, right? So it's that peculiar flavor that bacon, that barbecue has, etc. because they're all smoked products. Okay, guys. And then also like liquid smoke and things like hot dogs. Okay, guys. My vegetables have now been properly, properly cooked down for the soup today. They've become one with the oil. The oil has become beautifully, beautifully flavored. And I'm just going to go ahead and clean off this spatula. And I'll be using the smaller one again, just so that I can get onto the sides of the pot really, really easily. So guys, let's go ahead and add in the serranos now, right? Let's just go ahead and add those on in. We're going to get our chilies cooked. We didn't add the suganos in the beginning because the suganos take significantly less time to cook through. If we added them in earlier, we would have just ended up burning the suganos instead. And that's not what we're looking to really achieve here. We're just looking to infuse the oil. We're looking to get them a little bit toasted, a little bit warm through, a little bit cooked down, okay? So we added in my sugano chilies. And now guys, um, we're adding in the garlic last. The reason why we add the garlic last is because the garlic is the thing that does burn the absolute easiest. I'm also getting my tomatoes ready to go because the tomatoes are going to be the thing that deglazes and cools down the pan. We're going to rapidly add in a bunch of moisture at once and it's going to stop anything from continuing to stick or burn during this cooking process. So the vegetables are picking up a really, really beautiful color. They're also, in the liquid that came out of them, in the liquid that evaporated, we developed a little coating of almost like the sugars and all the stuff that was released by the vegetables that stuck to the bottom. And so the addition of the tomato is going to deglaze that. We're going to dissolve it back into the liquid. Does everybody understand? I don't have to tell you what to do. You know exactly what you're gonna do for me. The chicken stock is going, the chicken stock has a little bit of time left on it. And now guys, we're going to go in and add the garlic. The garlic goes in now. And this is where we want to go ahead and have the tomatoes handy. Okay, the garlic is going to be the last addition of dry ingredients into this pot. We're breaking it up. We're trying to get some color developed on the garlic, but we only need to really cook this for about a minute maximum. And the reason why we cook it so little is if we cooked it any longer, we would begin to burn the garlic instead. So I have like these little clumps of garlic or so. I'm just breaking them up. I'm mixing them around and I'm building a little bit of color, a little bit of additional flavor. And this is going to be the base of today's soup, guys. Excellent. All of those aromatics, everything is going to flavor this broth really, really well. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? Okay, guess what? The garlic, I would now probably say in about 10 seconds is done. That is all the cooking that it's going to need for us. And now guys, in we go with the tomatoes. The tomatoes stop things from sealing. The tomatoes, the wetness, we get to now go ahead and dissolve anything. We get to deglaze, we get to dissolve anything that could be possibly stuck to the bottom. And we're going to give the tomatoes a bit of a head start in cooking. We're just going to boil this down essentially. We're basically building a tomato sauce with which we're going to flavor the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the soup with, okay? So guys, we're scraping it up. We're scraping it up, we're scraping it up. And don't worry about the spices, we'll get to those in a second, okay? We're scraping everything up on the bottom. We're using the wooden spoon again. If you're using a metal spoon for this, you have messed up and you need to go buy a new like cuisine. Well, you don't need to go buy a new one, but just again, the only way that you can gently scrape is by using something wooden or something silicone for something like this, okay? And so this part of the pan was a little bit drier than the others. So that is the side that I really want to emphasize and focus on. And now I'm just going to go ahead and give these tomatoes a bit of a cook. I'm not really looking for the raw flavor of tomatoes in today's soup, okay? So I'm just going at it and I'm letting them do their thing. Lovely. Scraping everything, everything, everything I possibly can up from the bottom. And we'll also go ahead and add in a little bit of salt. We want to make sure that the heat isn't too high. Because of how viscous this has become with the addition of the tomatoes, if we have the heat too high, it's just going to end up splashing everywhere. The key, once again, is to cook this nice and low and slow, okay? And the more thick it gets, the more it's actually going to end up splashing. These are my beautiful charred tomatoes, my beautiful charred chili. This is basically like a really spicy salsa, plus uh, the carrots and the celery in there. So it's going to be making a really, really, really delicious soup for us today. And I'm pretty excited about it. Are you guys also excited? Or not so much?
for this one. The thing I'm most excited for, guys, is going to be the cream biscuits. So uh, that's all gonna be happening later. And I'm going to just take a second because now we don't have to necessarily baby that pan so much. I'm going to go ahead and just wipe off my station, wipe off my knife, put a couple of things away while we have that luxury and that privilege to do so. Because remember guys, now we're back in passive time. This is passive time. This is when you can ask me questions, right? Because all I'm doing is I'm occasionally coming back to the pot, giving it a little stew to make sure nothing is really scorching. And guess what? Nothing is scorching. And we're just looking to cook this down and evaporate it. Okay. And we might even get some color if we evaporate enough. I'm excited to see how you make the biscuits. I haven't heard of those. Well, I'm excited to make them too. And the reason why I'm excited for the biscuits is because I always have a surplus of heavy cream at home that in, uh, always ends up going bad at some point or another. And so everything, what it means, everything about cooking at home is to use up leftovers. The reason I'm using this specific dish is because I had leftover kale, I had leftover carrots and celery, and I have leftover cilantro and dill, which is what I will be finishing today's soup with. It's going to be delicious and herbaceous full of vegetables, full of flavor. This is the amount of effort and love that I like putting into my soups, right? I don't just, you could throw things into a pot and just boil them. I'm not necessarily looking down on that, but what I'm saying is you can do so much more. You have so much additional room for creativity, guys. Okay, so now that we're hitting this viscosity, again, I'm just going to opt for my smaller spatula here, just so I can really, really, again, scrape up the sides, make sure nothing is sticking over there, and we're just going through the bottom every so often, because with something this viscous and this sweet and starchy, it can easily burn on the bottom. So every now and then, we give it a little stir. Okay, let's go ahead and throw this into the dishwasher, my little blender cup, for the moment, for the time being. Okay. And now we can go ahead and think about what else we need to do. The stock is about 11 minutes away. We're going to be gently poaching the chicken. The reason we gently poach it is so that it cooks nice and evenly. Once the chicken is poached, which would take about 30 minutes in total, uh, we will be taking it out, shredding it up and putting it back into the final soup product itself. So it's going to be really good. We also have to shuck some corn. Um, we have to take the husks off of it. And then I need to think about, do I want to shave the corn or do I really want to go for like the really like traditional caldo de pollo style, which is having these big coins of corn on the cob inside. And I feel like that's what I want to do. That is what I'm leaning towards at least at the moment. And I might just use like a really bad knife for that, just in case it like ends up chipping my knife um, because I have really nice knives and such an aggressive motion to cut through the cob. Um, might be bad for it, so we'll decide. So guys, this tomato base, this tomato sauce is getting slowly but surely thicker and thicker as it goes on. Does anybody have any questions? It can be about this dish. It can be about absolutely anything that you would like, because guess what? You have my time, you have my attention. I wanna help you cook at home. And we can just go ahead and get some of the other prep done and out of the way for later today. Okay cooking it down, waiting for the stock to be done. And by the way, that's why it's nice to have an instant pot. Um, in 50 minutes time, we'll have a really delicious golden rich chicken stock um, as opposed to having to necessarily wait for hours. Uh, having an instant pot has been one of the biggest changes in my life that has allowed me to make beans and stocks incredibly consistently. The homemade beans and homemade stocks, one of the best ways to really level it up. Is there a good time to add dry spices to a super seasoning or is it better to use veggies and herbs for that? So cactus, really good question. It depends on the spices and I'm going to talk about why and what we're using in just a second. Certain spices you want to fry and toast to make sure that it infuses into the oil itself. Um, certain spices you only need to steep. For example, things like dried herbs, specifically the oregano, we're only going to be adding it in towards the end. And the cumin seeds, I admittedly completely forgot about. The cumin seeds I would have liked to have ground up and fried alongside the vegetables. So my general rule of thumb is if it's an herb, add it at the end. If it's like a dry spice or a dry chili, try to fry it in the fat itself because you're looking to infuse the fat with all fat soluble flavonoids. And you're also looking to get some aroma built up simultaneously. Okay, you're looking to toast that spice. Okay guys, but I don't add dry spices, things like pepper and stuff at the end. The only things I add at the end would be things like soft herbs, like uh, in my case, the dry oregano. So guys, my tomato base here is getting super, super thick. It's getting super, super viscous. It's now cooking down. It's slowly going to start developing some color on the bottom as well, right? And this is going to be the base of so much flavor for today's soup. So here's what we have to do. We're going to be poaching the chicken itself. We're going to be shucking the coin. We'll be cutting it up into coins as well. We'll be straining out the broth as well. We gotta make the cream biscuits. We have a lot to still get done ahead of us. Let me go ahead and have a nice little sip of water in the meantime. 
Mm. And it's just going and it's just doing its thing. Nice low heat. Continuously scraping off the sides. And we're building this incredible, delicious tomato base. Sorry that I'm repeating myself so much. Uh, we're just really, really focusing on this at the moment. Okay, let's just go ahead and get some of my other vegetable prep done. Um, I wanna go ahead and continuously slice up some herbs. And these herbs are going to be what we finish the soup with today. So, everybody, I have a plethora of cilantro and I have a plethora of dill. So I love showing off all the different ways that you can use up excess herbs in a final product. Because guess what? When you buy produce, I wanna make sure everybody's tapped in for this. A really, really huge problem with supermarkets is that it's very difficult to get just the amount that you need. Especially because more and more young people are living by themselves. They don't live in family settings. And even if they do live with other people and they live with roommates, I wanna hear yes, chef. I wanna make sure everybody's listening. A really huge challenge is that you buy a bundle of produce, you buy a bundle of herbs, and then it goes bad really quickly. Um, and because you're just not able to use up all of it in time. And so, what grocery stores do, they, send, they sell you teeny tiny little bundles of plastic packaged cilantro, or whatever you can think of for like a dollar fifty, when a bundle like this can cost 80 cents. And they sell you those little quantities so that you're not wasting it and then you feel like you're saving money. But guys, one of the best ways to use up old herbs is to finish a soup off with them. So this cilantro, I'm going to be using up the last of it. I'm taking it and I'm plucking it off the stems because the stems I find are a little bit fibrous. You don't have to do this step. Everything at home is all about using up produce. So I remember how I showed you how to blend herbs, right? When we blanch it and we can make a sauce or a dressing out of it. That's also a really nice way to do so. I want to encourage people to cook with more and more fresh herbs, but it's really difficult if you're limiting yourself to only using them as a garnish. We're finishing an entire soup off with them. Right, Noi? That's what I'm talking about. And so one of the ways that we keep them fresh, by the way, is in a plastic container in a Tupperware or a glass jar with a paper towel. The paper towel is a natural humidity regulator. It stops it from being too moist. It stops it from being too dry. That's how we keep this cilantro fresh for even over a week sometimes inside of my fridge. It is the optimal way to do so, so it doesn't get too soft. I see some people stick it into like a jar and stuff, and I think that's like nonsense, like a jar with water in it. I don't think that does anything because the tops of the leaves, they get like wilted anyways. The optimal method, guys, again, we don't pre-chop them. We do what we call non-destructive prep. There is a difference in cooking between destructive prep and non-destructive prep. Destructive prep is what I like to call whenever we process something, whenever we cut it, whenever we chop it, whenever we pluck it. The more we do it, the more we undergo um, destructive prep, the less of a shelf life that thing has. So consider these herbs, for instance, consider the cilantro. I didn't pre-chop it and put it in a container. If I pre-chopped it, it would lose a lot of its moisture, it would turn brown sooner, right? Because you're destroying a lot more of the cells of the actual cilantro it leaves themselves. So all I did was I gently washed it, I tore off a chunk of the stems, and then I kept them intact in my fridge until I'm ready to use them. So we get to really, really keep them alive a lot longer. Let's go ahead and give my tomatoes yet another stir, guys, just to make sure that nothing could be possibly squelching on the bottom. It's becoming this really, really lovely thick tomato sauce. Incredible. So let's talk about how to slice herbs. Chat. We do not chop in this household. We exclusively slice. And what it means to slice is to take all of your beautiful herbs, all of these bad boys, we take them and we go ahead and we bundle them up. We hold it nice and firm, not so firm, okay, that we crush it. This is like a little baby bird. Imagine the cilantro is a little tiny baby bird. Chirp, chirp, even. That's a, that was the baby bird, not me. Okay, we hold it nice and gentle in our hands. We do not crush it so that it, we don't like squish its little brains out and we don't hold it so gently that it flies away. You're going to take your cute little baby bird, chirp, chirp. That was it moving and wiggling in my hand. Okay, and now we slice him. We slice him up nice and thin and we use the full length of the knife. We do not crush it. We do not chop. We use minimal vertical force. We're just pulling and pushing and pulling and pushing, but we're not going down. You guys cannot see how gentle I'm being. I'm using the full length of my knife, and that's why you need a nice long knife, like a gyudo, like a chef's knife. Something with enough length that lets us get through this with minimal vertical force. And that way, we keep the herbs nice and fresh and nice and green without crushing the cells, without destroying them. We don't chop the bird alley, we slice him instead. You're a surgeon. You have to think about yourself as a surgeon. 
I am a surgeon. You use a scalpel because it's really, really sharp, but you're not going in there and hammering it into somebody, okay? So let's go ahead and once again, now the tomato sauce, guys. The tomato sauce itself is getting nice and roasted. It's almost developing a little bit of color for itself, right? It's slightly sticking to the bottom, which is a good thing. We've evaporated enough moisture from it that it's now beginning to almost caramelize for itself. We're building deeper and deeper and deeper flavor as we go on, and then we'll be deglazing it with the chicken stock once that's ready, guys. So guys, look at my beautiful baby bird, all nice and sliced up and ready to go. And now I'm going to go ahead and get it in here. My partner hates garlic, onions, and cilantro. Any advice on flavoring without those? Um, great question. Now, when you say your partner hates garlic, onions, and cilantro, here's the thing. I'm gonna make a prediction right now, knives. I'm gonna make a prediction right now. Here's the thing. This is going to sound very elitist, and I'm going to sound like an asshole for a second, but I wanna talk to you about uneducated preferences. So what does this mean? I, again, I, I just need you to bear with me for a second while I uh, finish up this explanation before I say anything too mean. So most people that don't know enough about something, they make a broad overarching statement. I'll give you a really good example. Somebody says, I don't like jazz music, right? There's an entire movie about this, right? Somebody says, I don't like jazz music. Well, what do you mean you don't like jazz music? What is it specifically about jazz music you don't like? Is it about a specific instrument? Is it about a certain tempo? What, what do you mean? It's such a broad overarching thing and it's actually a non-specific preference is what that is. So when somebody says they don't like jazz, I promise you they don't know enough about jazz to know the things that they don't like about it. Okay, so that's not me saying they don't have a preference. I'm saying they have a preference. I'm saying they don't know enough about that thing to actually define the specifics of that preference. Let's say they just hate the way a saxophone sounds in something, right, in a certain way, and you're like, okay, great. What about jazz without a saxophone? And then they're like, wait, this is amazing. Also, that's my pressure cooker done. So I'm gonna release the pressure and keep going. Okay, so same exact thing when somebody says they don't like onions and they don't like garlic. I don't actually consider that as a complete statement. The first thing that you have to do is to figure out what it is about onions, garlic, and cilantro. Also, stir. Thank you so much for the five gifted subs. Thank you, thank you. The first thing that you need to figure out for your partner is what is it they don't like about onions, garlic, cilantro. Do they not like the texture of raw onions? Do they not like the texture of cooked onions? Do they not like the flavor of it? Now, what if it's blended into something? Do they not like pickled onions? Do they not like a raw salsa format? So you've, now we've broken this down into a bunch of different things. A lot of people, they don't love the texture of a raw onion. So what I would do instead is I would feature cooked onions in something else. If they don't like biting into any form of onion, John Dahlia, thank you so much for the five gifted subs. You guys are so sweet to me today. Thank you, thank you. If somebody doesn't like the texture of a cooked onion, but they might like the flavor, then I would blend it in. What about an onion that we have in the chicken stock flavor and get instead? Right? And so, what am I trying to say? When you tell me that your partner doesn't like onions, garlic, and cilantro, I feel like that's an incredibly incomplete statement. You can't just not like all of them. I promise you, there is at least one specific cooking method that they will actually end up enjoying. And so, I can't give you any workarounds because that preference is a little too non-specific than to just completely avoid it. I forgot who already asked that initial question. Um, so I apologize if I went on an extended rant. Also, thank you, sir. That's really, really sweet of you. Um, I hope that answers your question for a little bit. So if you give me some more details, I want you to interrogate your partner. I want you to ask them things about it. I want you to literally be like, okay, can you just try this in different ways so we can figure out what you like and don't like? Do they like it caramelized? Do they like it sauteed? Do they like it raw? Do they like it pickled? Do they like it blended into something? Would they like it in a chicken stock if there was just like an onion in there? Figure out the specifics of those preferences. That would be my advice for you, instead of immediately thinking about substitutes. So, but that's how difficult it is to actually cook for somebody with preferences, especially to the layman that might not necessarily know the most about this thing. It's difficult, it's a challenge. It takes time and care and effort. And that's what I really, really highly recommend you to do. Put in that effort and they will become a lot more knowledgeable about themselves and the specifics of their own preference. So that's my long, super pretentious answer to when you ask me, uh, my partner doesn't like onion, cilantro, and garlic. I don't believe that they don't like onion, cilantro, and garlic because they're very broad. There's a lot of different ways that can be prepared and cooked. I believe them that they've had onion preparations, garlic preparations, cilantro preparations in the past that they did not enjoy. Everybody, let's do a recap session. Today, we're doing two things. We're doing a really, really beautiful chicken, tomato, vegetable soup inspired by a caldo de pollo. 
okay? And now we're also going to be making some delicious heavy cream two ingredient biscuits. This was so much effort that we put into this vegetable base, guys. We sauteed our mille pois, this collection of onions, carrots, and celery, and a bunch of olive oil. We added in serrano chilies. We blended up a charred tomato. We blended up as well, um, you know, a charred serrano. We added some more serranos. Okay, and then we let the tomato sauce basically cook down. And now the homemade chicken stock has officially been completed, guys. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that even looks like. I'm going to set that pot aside for just a second. We're going to go ahead and head over to my pressure cooker pot. I release the pressure from it. And now we have a beautiful, beautiful homemade chicken stock. And this is why I encourage people to always be buying whole chickens. When you buy whole chickens, you get the added benefit of all of that incredible byproduct. So guys, that's your chicken stock. Nice and golden. Okay. Nice and golden. Nice and ready to go. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to set up a little strainer. And we're going to go ahead and pour some of the chicken stock inside. I might use all of it. I might not use all of it. We'll see how much soup and how much liquid we're actually going to need for today. Buy whole chickens. If you buy whole chickens, you get the chicken bones. You get that incredibly delicious byproduct, guys. You buy whole chickens, and then you're able to go ahead and make homemade chicken stock. This is something that I think everybody should get into the habit of doing. Make a big batch of chicken stock in advance. Save all the chicken bones, make a huge pot of it, and keep it in your freezer. So let's go ahead, and we're just going to gently go in, and we're just going to go ahead and strain these out little by little. Just taking our time, being nice and patient, and the strainer is just to catch any remaining solids that we possibly have on the inside, okay? So get rid of it, get it all done. Let's get all of that gorgeous, delicious homemade chicken stock. We have the carrots in there for the sweetness. We have the onions in there for that delicious alliaminess. We have the celery uh, scraps in there as well. We have all of those lovely chicken bones. We have some bay leaves for the herbaceousness. This is an incredible homemade chicken stock, guys. You know where to find a whole chicken around here? Shark dog? Go to a supermarket. Find a butcher shop. Find a Latin supermarket. Um, can you make a stock with Cornish, uh, Cornish hen bones? Absolutely you can. Is buying a whole chicken more cost effective? Absolutely it is. Well, it depends. It depends what's on sale because they typically have older chicken on sale. But in my area, yes, buying a whole chicken is cheaper. And then if you think about what we're getting out of the different parts, if you think about what we're getting out of the bones, we get this amazing byproduct. We are saving substantial money. For me at least. Okay? So it depends where you're at. But typically, buying a whole chicken should be cheaper. Okay, guys, now that we've sort of hit this stage, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and just start discarding some of the solids. I'm going to just picking, uh, I'm going to pick up the solids and I have a waste bowl ready to go as well, right? So these are the chicken bones. This is my onion and stuff. We strain it off, right? We take it, we pick it off and into my waste bowl, all of it goes because we no longer need it. Everybody, please say thank you to Mr. Aromatic. Please say thank you to Mr. Chicken Bone, okay? They did a wonderful job of flavoring this gorgeous, gorgeous stock for us. And so the sacrifice was not in vain because they have now helped to improve the next generation, parentheses, the chicken soup that they will be a part of. We are built off the backs of our ancestors, guys. The ghosts of revolutions past. I think that's a quote from Zizek or something. Right. So even though... Uh, they have sacrificed themselves. Their sacrifice was not in vain because now they are a part of something bigger and even better than they could have possibly imagined during their lifetimes. I know I'm being so dramatic over chicken bones, so I uh, apologize. I think I'm being kind of cringe, actually. Okay, um, I think I'm just going to do all this chicken stock, guys, because I want a nice big pot of chicken soup. Okay, I want a lot of it. And this is also what I just really consider in the realm of perfect home cooking. This is an ideal home food. It's a soup. This reheats exceptionally well. This is the kind of thing that you want to be eating at home. It holds in a fridge while you can take it in a thermos to work, which is what I'm going to do next time I have work. Okay. And so let's go ahead and take the rest of this bad boy and pour it all into the strainer. There we go. Everything has now been done. Everything has now been accomplished. The pressure cooker has done a wonderful job for us. And now we have this incredible, incredible chicken stock, guys. So let's go ahead and proceed with the next steps. I'm just going to go ahead and remove this ladle. Lovely. All right. And we take this and we scoop this off into my waste bowl. Lovely. Okay, dokie, guys. Let's go ahead and just clean up my station really, really quickly. Beautiful. Okay. 
I'm going to go ahead and give this a little rotation. Guys, look at this chicken stock with the tomatoes now, right? It's beautiful. I'm going to go ahead and take a second just to throw some things away into my dishwasher. Because again, guys, cleaning as you go. That's what it means to cook at home. It takes a little bit more time, but you're saving a lot of time afterwards. Clean as you go, have an empty dishwasher, and you will thank yourself later. Please and thank you, trust me. I'm gonna let all these scraps cool off before I go ahead and properly throw them away. So they just are going to need a second. And now guys, let's go ahead and stir up all of the tomatoes and all the vegetables from the bottom, okay? Because again, they're stuck at the bottom. We wanna dissolve them all. And we're not looking for this to be a thicker, viscous soup. The blended tomatoes are going to add some really, really pleasant viscosity. But guys, look at the color of the soup already. Would this soup hold up well in a freezer? Absolutely. Uh, chef, how do you make sure that uh, a chef like a Dorado is cooked through and it's not burnt? So, really good question. I haven't cooked the Dorado before. In fact, I don't work with a lot of whole fish. I don't work with a lot of whole fish because I don't have access to good quality fish where I live for an affordable price. So, that is somewhere I'm really, really lacking, and it's not actually somewhere I can even improve upon or give you advice. I don't have any specific tips other than, you know, don't overcook it, right? Okay, so again, I'm just scraping off anything that could be stuck to the sides. We don't get to see it because this broth is so cloudy now, right? Guys, I think that looks gorgeous. That looks pretty heckin' beautiful, heckin'. Oh, look at that shimmer. Look at that shimmer. Guys, say it with me. Somebody please say it. Anime food looks so good or something. Look at that shimmer. Look at those waves. Look how beautiful that is. I actually do want to sip it. Let's give it a taste. I am curious to see how it came out. You guys think we should give it a little sip? Let's give it a little sip skis. And so it should be lacking in salt at this stage because again, we haven't added in my actual chicken bouillon powder. Ooh, that is spicy. Oh my goodness, that is really good. I think that was a little spicier than I was actually initially shooting for. That does have a cumulative three so of chilies in there. Um, okay guys, so that's really delicious, but you might be asking me, if I made a homemade chicken stock, why am I adding in powdered chicken bouillon? The reason why I'm adding, ooh, that's spicy. The reason why I'm adding in powdered chicken bouillon is because I'm really inspired by a Latin American called the de pollo. This stuff is used all the time in Latin American cooking. There is nothing cheating about it. There's nothing trashy about it, as so many different pretentious chefs would love to say. But having a mixture of homemade chicken broth and then also some of this powdered stuff, it just gives you another dimension of real proper oomph. Okay? It gives it so much more flavor. So you could just use this in water. It's a little silly to use this and chicken stock and homemade chicken stock together, but I, it's something I love doing at home that really, really, like, really pushes the maximum on how much flavor we can shove in there. Okay guys, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and glove up. And I'm going to go ahead and gently lay in uh, the chicken inside, okay? And so, here is the idea. We're going to poach this chicken. Poaching is not boiling, poaching is not blanching. This stock is never going to come up to a boil while the chicken is inside of it. And the reason why we never want it to come up to a boil is because if we boil it, we're going to overcook the outside before the inside is done. So guys, all I do is I'm going to take my chicken legs, keeping them whole, skin on. We're going to peel off the skin once it's done cooking and the chicken breasts, and it's going to go directly inside. The goal is to gently, 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 gently cook them. So if we had to shoot for the temperature, for the breast, we're looking for at 155, right? For the legs, we're shooting at around 170. And now we go ahead and we take this, and we take it, and we put it onto a medium heat. We are looking for this to be slightly bubbling. We never want this to be boiling. If your chicken stock is boiling with the pieces inside of it, congratulations, you're going to get dry, stringy, overcooked chicken by the time that the inside of it is done. I demand a yes chef right now, please and thank you. I demand it. This is how, and, and you guys might see this, you might think I'm cooking chicken in water. Oh, it's a boiled chicken, Duram, girl, how could you? Boiled, white people, bland, no. Boiling it is if it was bubbling and boiling and toiling at 100 degrees Celsius. And when you do it at 100 degrees Celsius, the outside will overcook by the time the inside is done. Think of a sous vide. Think of a slow roast. You cook it gently. You give it a lot of love. You give it a lot of affection. And it's going to get done in time. You just have to trust the process. Okay? It's going to take about 20 to 30 minutes for the chicken breast to be done, a little bit longer for the legs and the thighs. But we're not looking for it to get so overcooked that it falls apart because we're looking to easily pick off the bones and such, okay? 
So I've cleaned up around me. I've taken away a couple of things that we do not need. I'm also going to go ahead and put this away. I'm not really going to concern myself with stirring this too much until the chicken is at least not completely raw. Okay, so that's going. Let's go ahead and proceed with everything else. Guys, today we're doing a really beautiful spicy tomato chicken vegetable soup. We still have it in, added in all the vegetables. I'm going to add these bad boys in about 10 minutes in uh, alongside the corn. I'm not adding them in immediately because we need to give chicken the time to cook. And I don't want my vegetables to overcook subsequently. Okay. Um, and so it's going to have the onions, it's gonna have the carrots, it's gonna have the celery. Chunky yogurt, thank you so much for the prime sub. We sauteed finely chopped carrots, onions, and celery, the classic French meal pois, the trinity. We sauteed it in olive oil. We added in some serranos, we added in some garlic. We added in some freshly blended uh, tomatoes and chard chilies. We cooked all that down, made a homemade stock out of a whole chicken. Added it in, we added in chicken legs, we added in chicken breast. This soup has so much love and so much care and intention and affection actually be put into it, guys. It's going to have so much flavor. And so we now have to think about what are some of the last components that we need for today's soup. And then we will begin doing the biscuits, which I'm really, really excited for. This is the peak of home cooking. Chat. Why is it the peak of home cooking? Because we're using everything that we have and we're using up things that we're about to go bad in the fridge. What do I think about adding cream to make the spice less intense? I don't love adding cream to liquidy soups. I like only doing them to blended soups, Ali. You could add in a little bit of cream to make it less intense, but because of how watery it is, you're going to need a lot of cream to actually justify it because it could also uh, end up splitting a little teeny tiny bit. It's not very stable, right? Because we don't have any like starches in there or anything and it's not enough tomatoes for it to be thick and starchy. Um, so it can end up splitting just because of the ratio, uh, ratio. Okay, that's my thought there. If we add some flour in there and cream, then we can do the cream. Um, okay. So guys, let's go ahead and now do the rest of the herbs. So remember how I talked to you about home cooking. Remember how I talked about using up fresh herbs. That is the point of today. That is the goal. That is the intention. I have a bunch of old cilantro and a bunch of old dill. We're going to be adding it in towards the end of the soup. It is such a challenge. Oh. It is such a challenge to use up a lot of produce at home, especially when you live with cook for one or two people maximum. Grocery stores, they sell you really big bundles of stuff. And so I just wanna show you how to work it. I wanna show you all these different techniques, right? And so I love finishing soups and especially the cilantro in the context of all these other, um, you know, Latin American flavors that we have. It's going to be delicious. Now, let's move on to the next component, something that is not traditional in a lot of Latin American cooking. We have some dill. I live in a Russian household. This was dill given to me, I think, by my grandmother, okay, because she just probably bought some extra. And now we also want to go ahead and integrate this into the soup. Everybody, I want you to tap in. I want to hear a nice yes, chef. Dill is misunderstood and incredibly underused in the average American home kitchen. Many of you are European, I know many of you aren't Americans, but the way that I see the majority of Americans cook with dill is they completely pigeonhole themselves. They use it exclusively with salmon and lemon for some reason. And so, oh, let's have some water. I think I'm really dehydrated. Dill is really beautiful. I love it with potatoes. I love it in soups as well. I love it in borscht. I love it in so many different soups. So I'm taking some inspiration with the way that I grew up eating it. What's the big deal? Uh, this guy right here. So guys, I'm gonna be taking him, I'm gonna be plucking him off my stem. Chunky yogurt, how'd you find the stream? How'd you find the cooking show? It's lovely to have you. Okay guys, and again, we're just taking off the stems because they tend to be a little bit woody, okay? Not really what I'm looking for out of it. And the herbs are going to get added into the end because they're really volatile. Uh, you can lose a lot of flavor if you end up cooking them down too much. So we're just going to add it as we turn off the pot. So it's basically gonna be the last component. And again, everything about today, guys, is using up leftovers. The reason why we're doing the cream biscuits is because I have a whole pint of heavy cream I wanted to use up. For my Twitter, well, it's lovely to have you. Thank you for being cute. By the way, for those of you that haven't checked out my Patreon, type in exclamation mark Patreon or scroll down, go into the about section, the details, whatever. Um, I would love to be able to do this full time. I wanna teach people how to cook. I wanna be able to do this for free. And so the entire idea is this, I, I can't disable Twitch ads. I'm not able to. I have disabled all of the midstream ads though. So you'll never get a sh uh, an ad while watching the stream, I think. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I 
do not want to fund these streams through advertisement. I do not want to basically say, oh, this is for free, but to avoid the ads, you can go ahead and subscribe to me. I don't want to do that. There's ads that I can't, uh, can't turn off though. My entire idea here is I want to have information that is completely free for everybody to watch and listen to. Because we live in a day and age where information should theoretically be free and easy to replicate. When we have digital goods, Right? Like this live broadcast. This is a video that can be saved a million times over and it doesn't cost anything to do so. Thus, I don't think people should be paying any amount of money to actually watch this. But in order to actually do that, right? In order to make sure that this is something that can continue to stay available for everybody for free and so that I can one day be able to do this full time, all that I ask is from people that already do have money, right? If you do have the money, um, you know, a little bit of support on Patreon goes a really long way. The entire idea is the people with money that uh, do help out and thus everybody else will be able to benefit from it, right? I do not believe in the idea of advertisements on videos. I don't want to take any sponsorships, right? I've already been offered a couple. I don't want to take them at this stage because I don't want to basically sell out people's attention spans and become a walking slogan and a walking advertisement for somebody else. People deserve information and knowledge without being advertised to. And so in the meantime, the only amount of advertisement I am ethically okay with is my Patreon. So. That is the ethics, that is the philosophy of what I'm trying to do here. If I ever take a sponsorship, guys, I'm not gonna do the Patreon stuff. So I'm continuing to pluck. I'm continuing to get all of my dill off. Beautiful, beautifully done. And we're just continuing to pluck it. And I know this looks like a lot of dill, but that's okay. And Jack, it's okay. I'm not expecting anything from you specifically. Loving the top on you fit check, it's just the shirt. Today, it's just the shirt. So guys, I know this looks like a lot of dill. In fact, it might even be too much dill for the soup, but the entire goal of it is that we use it up so that we don't have to worry about uh, it later on, okay? We're taking the stock, we're going to heat it up now, right? We don't need this to be bubbling and boiling and toiling. All that we're really looking for is for it to be gently, gently bubbling. Because guys, we're not going to blast this chicken with heat. We're not going to be overcooking the outside of it. Uh, we're not using the stems, yeah, because I just don't love the texture of them. They're, uh, they're a little bit woody on dough. But you can, you can just chop it up and it'll be fine. I just find that it kind of gets stuck in my teeth sometimes. It's not a very pleasant mouth feel, right? So it's purely a textural thing for me. We have a mountain of dill. I know this looks like a lot of dill and it will be a lot of dill, but I just wanted to go ahead and use it up. So that's out of my fridge for good. The stems can be frozen free stock later, absolutely. But I would add them in at the end of a stock. What product would I advertise if I could? Jack, I do not dream of advertising a product. The only things I like, I mean, I really like the brand Masienda, right? That's where I get my masa from. That's where I got my tortilla press from. I really like Masienda. I really like Mavier. So I really like the cookware brands um, and stuff that I use. But like as nice as it would be to work something out with them, it is not an end goal to work with them. If it happens, it happens. Those would be the only ones I'd be ethically okay with because I know that these are ethical brands that actually do sell you good, uh, good stuff. So guys, let's talk about this really quickly. Let's talk about... Uh, how difficult it is as a home consumer, as a layman, to actually buy cookware. So let me tell you something. Let me tell you something right now. I want everybody to tap into this. My cooking is innately intertwined with philosophy and politics. You cannot separate the two. Everything is connected, okay? So I need to hear a nice yes chef from everybody watching. I want to make sure that you're all tapped in through this. And I'm going to talk about something that isn't your fault. Okay. There's a really huge problem. There's a really, really huge problem out there. And the problem is, for any industry, for any market, for any home consuming market, I want to say maybe cooking is the most egregious offender of this. It is so, so, so difficult for somebody who's trying to get into it to differentiate between actual quality products versus something that somebody's selling you. I need you all to understand something. A professional is not a indication of reliability. All that I mean, I want to hear, yes, chef, everybody watching. I need you all to tap into this. I need you all to understand about something right now. A professional does not mean that they are trustworthy. The only thing that makes a professional a professional is that they make money from doing something. You need to understand the intentions of the professional that is telling you about something. The world of cookware and cooking products is a catastrophe. It is a mess. You have so much overly designed, poorly designed, constantly reinvented garbage that they buy in bulk from AliExpress 
and they resell to you for 10 times the cost, and then they go ahead and they pay the next fucking Gordon Ramsay way too much money to be a little shill for a garbage product. Hexglad, one of the worst offenders of this. There is no universe in which Hexglad pans need to be costing that much money. Noel also did this. There was so many different nonstick cookware brands. And oh my god, the British TV chefs, those were the biggest sellouts of all. All of them became the slogan, the face of all of these garbage nonstick cookware brands. They all sell you nonsense because they are directly profiting from it. They try to use and feign the reliability and the professionalism and the trust that people have in them, right? And they take advantage of that for self-gain and for self-profit. I will never do that to you. I never intend on doing that. The day I do that is the day that the entire integrity of my cooking show dies. I will never take a sponsorship for any amount of money for a garbage brand. I am mad. I am mad, Jack. I am mad at all of the frauds and all of the bad faith uh, people that are taking advantage of home consumers. So, when it comes to actually shopping for home goods, when it actually comes to shopping for proper equipment at home, it's so difficult. Because so much of stuff nowadays is just uh, designed in a way that, you know, capitalism doesn't reward competition. Capitalism doesn't reward products because they're better. Competition rewards things that are more profitable and more sellable and things that look nicer. Profitability is not a sign of quality. And so the only reliable source is somebody who has good intentions and good experience and why they're recommending you something. And the only way to keep that pure is to make sure that they have no profit incentive from doing so. I have no profit incentive from recommending you Mizono UX 10 knives. I don't make any money from that. It is a product that I really, really love. I love this knife. I make no money from recommending the Zwilling Kramer knife. It's just a really, really good knife. I make no money from recommending you my Le Creuset Dutch Oven. I just know that these are good quality tools for my experience and the way that they actually work for me. And I can explain to you why they're good. The day that I have a profit incentive to advertise to you these kinds of things, it's over. Okay? It is absolutely over at that point onwards. And so, there is so much garbage out there on Amazon, on TV, on all these different cooking videos. Oh, the sponsorships that people take for absolute garbage that are overpriced. So the thing that I want you to do, the thing that I need you to do, okay? If there is something that you are considering purchasing and you want to know if it's a mistake or not, ask me. Go to my Discord, join my Discord, exclamation mark Discord. If you're thinking of buying a certain piece of cookware and it's expensive or whatever, right? And you're considering it and you're a little anxious about it, just ask me and I will give you my two cents on it because I don't want you guys to waste your money. Now, I might not necessarily always get back to all of you on it, but that is a very nice way that you can directly communicate with me if you have any kinds of questions, because it is so difficult for the average home cook. When you don't know and you're not an expert on something, you can end up wasting so much money buying garbage that you do not need, okay? You can easily waste it. That's not me. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to give you a path. Right? I'm trying to give you a path. I'm trying to show you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to help you. I want to help you guys out. So join my Discord, exclamation mark Discord. If you would like, you can also just scroll down. Um, join my community. If you have a cookware question or whatever, tag me, at me, ask me about it. Ask me if I have a recommendation for something. Okay? So that's what you should do. So guys, guess what? This is now boiling too aggressively. We don't want that chicken to get overcooked, do we? I want to hear you no know, chef, please and thank you. We don't want that chicken to get overcooked, so we're dropping it to a slight simmer. In fact, what I'm just going to do instead is I'm going to add in my carrots, onions, and celery, and we don't drop it from up high. You drop it from up high and it's gonna splash. Basically put it directly to the water, use the spatula to break the fall, and nothing is going to splash on its way back down. Let's not worry about salinity yet, because we'll get to that in just a second. We're going to add in some of my chicken bouillon. That's my carrots, that's my onions, and that's my celery. We're going to add in a really, really beautiful flavor into everything else. Okay. And now let's go in with a couple of big spoons of my powdered chicken bouillon. That is my, you know, I hate saying cheat code. I sound like a white guy making, you know, using MSG food the first time, right? But it is a, in a way, a cheat code to use both homemade chicken stock and then also powdered chicken bouillon, right? It is just everything at once. We are building flavor. Guys, today's stream is gonna be a long stream. Do you guys have any opposition to that? We're going to be going quite a bit over time today. So I'm going to go in with a couple of nice big spoonfuls. I don't even have to worry about stirring it in yet or anything. Three big spoonfuls or so. And then we'll come back and reassess the situation. 
And guys, we're not looking for this to be bubbling and boiling and toiling. Bubble, boil, and toil, you're going to go ahead and get a bunch of overcooked chicken. I'm setting a timer for about, uh, I wanna say at least like 20 minutes or so. And that is going to be the amount of time that the chicken breasts need to go ahead and get nice and tender that we can go ahead and shred it up. Okay, the longer the stream, the better. Well, I'm happy to help out, Trash Can Cat Mom. But yes, the way that you actually get answers about how to buy good cookware at home is to trust the people that are in a community and they don't give you advice because they are nepotistic, as in they're helping out somebody that is in that field, or they don't have a direct profit incentive. I don't have a direct profit incentive from recommending you any of the different products that I use at home. There is so much garbage out there. They sell you so much plastic garbage that breaks in a year and that you do not need at home, okay? I'm here to show you all of the essential, essential tools. And by the way, so many products are intentionally designed to not last. Think of one of those Amazon strawberry slicers. It has five soft stainless steel metal blades on it. You're not taking those off and sharpening them. When it's dull, it's dull. And then you have to throw it away. It's not built to last, okay? Which nicknames do you think are stupid to use? Jack, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Okay, let's go back to slicing the herbs. So guys, once again, we're never crushing them. We're never chopping them. We emphasize over and over on the stream that this is a slicing household. And what it means to slice is we take all of our herbs. In fact, we're going to do this in two bundles because we have so much to actually go through. How many times have you cut herbs and the bottom of your cutting board got wet? Your herbs turn brown and they lose all their flavor. That's because you crush them. We never, ever, ever chop herbs in this household. We slice them. We use a knife like a scalpel. We have something nice and sharp. Also, uh, Jack, you know what? I don't prefer the pet names. I just prefer chef. I just would like chef. Please and thank you. So we take our herbs, we bundle them up, and we use the full length of our knife. Minimal vertical force. You're not chopping a tree. If you chop a tree, you cleave it. When we're slicing herbs, guys, gentle, delicate, full length of your nice sharp knife all the way through. And this way, you're not gonna crush them. You're not going to expose all the cells. You're not going to expose the chlorophyll. You're not going to ruin your herbs. They're not going to lose their flavor and they're going to stand up to cooking or salads or wherever, or, or, excuse me, wherever else you actually want them. Slice and slice and slice so many times. Guys, let me show you a knife technique that I really hate. Can I show you something right now? I'm going to demonstrate and waste some herbs for us right now. I'm going to demonstrate something to all of you, right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna set, set that aside. I'm going to take this and give this a quarterly turn, right? This is what I'm doing. I'm just slicing right now. This is the way that you should be doing it, by the way, right? We take it and we slice it and we slice it and we slice it and we slice it. Because again, I hate having big pieces of herb. I want them to really contribute. Okay, oh, that's a stem. And what's nice about dill is you can easily pluck out the stems once you've begun the slicing process. Okay guys, so let me show you. This is what a beautifully chopped herb looks like, or a sliced herb, excuse me. You can tell the bottom isn't wet. The bottom of my cutting board, I mean, it's gonna be slightly damp, but it's not wet. So let me show you something right now. My most hated knife technique. I'm going to do this once and only once. I'm going to do this once and show you never again, and I'm gonna throw it away. So I'm going to just go ahead and take these so I don't ruin all of them. So let me show you my least favorite knife technique, guys. I'm going to try and destroy a minimal amount of herbs here. So many chefs, so many mediocre chefs that have no idea what they're doing. This is what they do, ready? They take a knife, they take a knife. Oh, my poor, my poor Mizono UX10. I'm sorry I'm gonna do this to you, baby. They take it and they do this. What is this? They take it and they go through it and they crush it and then they wipe off their knife and the herbs are sticking to the knife and they go back through it and they chop, 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 chop. And they go ahead and they slam their knife against the wooden cutting board and they dull the knife and they crush their herbs and look at the herbs. They're stuck to my knife, they're wet. The bottom of my cutting board is wet. It's painted with the blood of the dill. And when this happens, I'm not gonna do this anymore to my precious baby Dill. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'll never do that to you again. Let's go ahead and take them off. Oh, look at it, it's sticking to my bench scraper now, terrible. You have basically squished all of its blood and guts out, all of its chlorophyll, all of that volatility, all of that flavor. I know I'm being dramatic, it's not that big of a deal, but it's bad for your knife and it's suboptimal technique. Everybody, chopping is for chumps. 
Chopping is for the chumps, and you guys are the chumps. I want to hear the no chef. I want to make sure that are you chumps? I don't think you're chumps. Yes, chef. Cactus, you said a yes, chef, you're a chump? You're not a chump, cactus. You're watching this cooking show, you're not a chump. So let's go ahead and take it. And we take this next one. We're not gonna do the same thing. We had to make an example. We had to do a trolley problem. We had to sacrifice them to save the others. Guys, slice, sharp knife, slice it, bundle it, and we go all the way through. All the way. Also, John Dahlia, you asked me about pulling versus like pushing. Um, this is basically like a school of thought thing. This is a much more like Japanese technique to like pull it and a much more uh, Western chef knife technique to push it like this. And the reality is by pulling it, it's a little bit more technical, it's a little bit more difficult, but things stick less if you do it this way. Guys, look at this. Oh, these bad boys, these guys had to be chopped so these guys could be sliced. And let's take it and give it a quarter turn and give it another slice. Do I sharpen my own knives? I do not. Uh, I would need a whetstone for these and I do not own one and I'm not very good at it. I would love to take a knife sharpening class as like a little professional development. What do you guys think? Would you guys help me fund that? Because <laughs> I would like to ideally stop, uh, you know, going and getting my knives professionally sharpened. Okay, that's so much better. Guys, look at this. Look, it didn't stick to the knife, right? It's not sticking to the knife and it's not sticking to the cutting board. When it's sticking, that's because you've released the water by crushing it. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll set that up as like a goal or something. Or I'll talk about it and ask how much I need for it. I'll try to find some uh, classes in New York that offer that, in that case. I would love to do that. I'd love to also just show that off on stream at some point, right? Because this is, again, this is a skill that I am not very good at. And it's something that I would need to get better at because that's what it means to be a good home cook. At the moment, I do get mine professionally sharpened because it's easy for me. Um, but it just does, it's costly, right? It's not the cheapest thing in the world to do. So I'm just wiping all of this stuff off, getting all of it done. Beautiful. And guys, this is the epitome of home cooking yet again. We're using up all of these herbs. Every single last one of these, these were all of my leftovers that I had sitting in my fridge, right? My dill, my cilantro, ready to go. Okay. I'm actually going to start preheating the oven uh, for the biscuits. Okay. Let me just go ahead and check, uh, check something really nice and quick, guys. My apologies. I just have a reference for this. I have a reference. Because I'm going to be using the Serious Eats uh, drop biscuits. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get it to 450 degrees. Bake, 450. And you guys, you can see that pot is gently, gently bubbling. It's gently bubbling, it's gently, gently going, okay? So take a look. Take a look at this bad boy. So, again, we're poaching this chicken. We're not aggressively boiling it. We aggressively boil it, we end up destroying the chicken. Let's just go inside and just stir some of these vegetables back in. We're just stirring the chicken around. Um, we don't really have to flip the chicken. The only thing that you wanna make sure of though is that your chicken is not exposed. If the chicken is exposed, the top of it tends to sort of get undercooked. Okay, so I'm just gonna be mixing everything back on in. I'm just getting all that scum back inside of the pot. It's all flavor anyways. It'll all be okay. We don't really need to scrape the bottom because it's just wet enough that we know for a fact that it's gonna be delicious. Beautiful. Guys, look at this pot of soup. This pot of soup. It's getting late. Um, No, no, Jack, Jack, I will find my own knife sharpening class. Thank you, I appreciate it. Just I prefer you to DM it to me because I don't want people to know the specific place that I'm going to. Okay, so I will I will work that out for myself. That, I don't, I don't need help for that. Thank you, though. So, guys, the chicken soup is almost done. We're soon going to begin the cream biscuits. We have successfully used up all of my leftover herbs, and they're going to be added at the end of the soup. My leftover dill, my leftover cilantro. We also have my uh, kale. I had some leftover kale, guys. So that's also going to get added towards the end of the soup so it doesn't overcook too much. And now we're going to have to go ahead and start thinking a little bit about the corn component. The corn is actually going to take a little bit of work. This is going to take a little bit of elbow grease. So let's go ahead and begin this process now. I'm just gonna go ahead and get a bowl for it. Lovely, excellent. Okay, we need to start off by shucking the corn. So guys, we have these two big old things of corn. I actually don't think I wanna do this on the cutting board itself. Yeah, you can, you can DM it to me, Jack, but in general, in the future, I'd prefer if you didn't do that, okay? Thank you. 
So guys, we're going to go ahead and chuck this coin. I'm not gonna do this over the cutting board because I'm just gonna get it unnecessarily dirty uh, when I don't really need to be doing all that. Okay, and now let's begin this process. I haven't actually shucked a coin in a fairly long time. So uh, please bear with me for this process. This waste bowl might be a little too small, in fact. Now, I've seen people, they do it from, ooh, I can't break it. I've seen people, they do it from the back end because it's a lot easier to pull off the fibers that way. But I don't think I can actually get a good grip there. All right, let's just start shucking off some of the outer leaves seeing if I can get an opening into the inner one. And yeah, guys, sometimes they're covered in sand, sometimes they're covered in dirt. So it's just nice to not do this over cutting board, right? Because these do get pretty, they do get pretty dirty. So these outer leaves, I'm just gonna go ahead and discard it. Again, I should have probably had a bigger waste bowl, which I think I can just actually do because I do have a big waste bowl right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and be just shucking these over this instead. Okay, can I? Yep, I can't, perfect. That's what I was looking to do. So I'm doing this from the back of the coin itself, guys. Let's actually get you all in a little bit closer, okay? I just want you all to be able to see all this. So I'm going to be going in from the back end of the coin because if I do remember, and it's been a very long time, so please forgive me, um, it does actually do a much easier job of getting rid of all the fibers, okay? As opposed to if we did it from the front. Same idea as like a banana because all the fibers, they're sprouting out from the back end. Right? And so, the theory is if you do it from the back end, we'll be able to get all of them out. I hope so. Chat, do you believe in me? Let's go ahead and actually turn down the heat on this. This looks a little too high for me at the moment. Do you believe in me? I think so. Maybe somebody can also Google it and confirm for me. I do feel embarrassed that I did not know this, but also it has just been a very long time since I've done this. It's no longer peeling very easily from this back end. Okay. Okay. We're getting there slowly but surely. It's happening. Probably could make some really nice tamales out of it. All right. Oh, I love tamales, but that's not gonna be a home food for me. That's much more celebratory. Okay guys, so yeah, 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 there it is, there it is. Right, we take it from the back end, and now, by taking it from the back end, through the other way, we're able to go ahead and expose the coin itself, and then it's going to peel I'm going to get some gloves for this so I have some slightly better traction because the nitrile gloves, they do have a little bit more friction. Let's go ahead and do that really quick. And I'm also going to give my soup a little stir, slightly lower that heat. We have about eight more minutes for the chicken breast to get cooked. The legs and the thighs, they will need to take a lot longer. The chicken breast, we don't want it to overcook, right? We just want to get it cooked through so that we can shred it up really beautifully. Okay, so that's going. That looks really, really good. Okay, guys. Let's keep on doing this. Have faith that we will get this done. Yeah, 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 this seems to actually be doing a really good job of this through this specific method. Right, so we go in from the back end and that's the way that we take all the fibers off. Ah, uh, not perfect. Not perfect, actually. It does smell really, really good. By the way, does anybody have any cooking questions for me? Because I'm just going to be occupying myself with, you know, shucking some corn in the meantime. Okay, I know guys, I'm the world's slowest corn shucker, all right? I didn't, I grew up in New York. We didn't really eat fresh corn, except as like a novelty sometimes. Uh, I think what I said about it getting rid of all the husk might have actually just not been very true. So let's just get all these fibers off. I think my method was incredibly inefficient. I don't think I did a very good job with this, guys. I apologize. How would I... Is this, does somebody know a better method for this? This is actually where I would enlist somebody else's help. I'm sure there is a better method that you can do this. Cause again, we're not looking for all these little tiny fibers. Chopping the stem off would make it easier. Chat, what do you think? Does that have any merit? Does that suggestion have merit? And I just give it like a little rub because then it like sticks to your hands and it comes off. You think we give it a shot? We'll give it a shot. Okay, that is most of the fibers that I did just get off of it though. And that was not amazing. That was not perfect. It does sound logical. That does make sense. So let's use, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to dump out my waste bowl. <gasps> is my trash can full? Almost. The answer is almost full. Not quite, 
So it still has a little bit more garbage I could theoretically stuff in here. Ugh, I should probably replace the trash bag, but not, not yet. Yeah, guys, I'm gonna have to replace the trash bag in the middle. No, 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 no. It just needed a little adjustment and now it's fine. Now it's perfect. I will not be doing that on stream, I refuse. Okay, so you know what? Let's go ahead and do this out of a different one. All right, let's give it a shot. Again, I should have probably Googled a much better method to do so, right? A really nice way of just seeing how people do it is just looking at how prep cooks do it. And they usually have like the most efficient way. Okay guys, so let's just go ahead and cut off this end. And this is a knife. Again, this is a really trashy knife that I have here. It's not really good. I'm going to just be using that to trim off the bottom. And this is what we'll be using to actually chop it up into rounds. And now that we've chopped off the bottom, what do you guys think? Do you guys think this is gonna peel up nice? Let's go take a look. It does peel up a lot easier doing this. And again, the idea, the theory of this I'm applying to is similar to that of a banana, right? Which is you peel it from the back end, you get rid of all the fibers that way. Peel it from the back end, you get rid of all the fibers. Right? So we'll see. But I'm just struggling with actually getting in there and getting that initial incision properly dealt with. Okay? Okay? This does seem to be working significantly better, but the other end of it is still, it's a little suboptimal. This was at least a lot faster. Okay, whatever, whatever, not ideal, not perfect. They didn't get all the fibers out, guys. Such is how life goes, I suppose. Yeah, these fibers are just really stuck in there, they're really nestled in. So if anybody has any better methods for me in the future, it'd be very appreciated. So I'm gonna be cutting this fairly in an impractical way. This is one of the few times that I'm actually gonna be chopping because we're going to be going through something hard. And this is why I recommend not using an amazing knife. You just need something just sharp enough, but a cleaver for something like this would be pretty ideal. Because we're going to be cutting through the actual cob of the corn. Okay. Chop bottom, squeeze from the top. Well, it's too late because we just have two. So that's all that we actually needed for today. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and dump out my waste bowl. So, um, yes, corn is typically better off the cob. I just think it's really, really fun to eat it this way um, because I'm sort of emulating a caldo de pollo. And in a caldo de pollo, oh, guys, check a look. The chicken legs are kind of floating to the top. We just want to flip them over, make sure they're not escaping or anything. We give the soup a little stir. And in a caldo de pollo, you instead have these super, super big corns. Do I have a bristled brush to get rid of the uh, fibers easier? I do not. Nothing at the moment. So all I do... Right? I'm just gonna go ahead and wipe it off. Right? That's fine. It's fine. It's fine if we get a few fibers. It's not gonna be the end of the world. So guys, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut this up into coins. That beeping sound was telling me that my oven was ready to go. We have about two more minutes left on the chicken cook time. Use a, uh, you wanna use a cleaver, you wanna use a hatchet, you wanna use a slightly thicker knife. Don't use, everybody tap in. I wanna make sure that you're all listening to this. Okay, knives have different degree bevels. I wanna hear yes chef, everybody watching. Knives have different degree bevels. The thinner the angle, so let's say a 15 degree knife, the sharper it is, but the more delicate it is. A lot of Japanese knives are sharp into 15 degrees. The blunter the angle, meaning 20 degrees, something like that, the more durable that edge actually is, but the less sharp it is. So if you have a cleaver, cleavers are typically done to like that 15 degree angle, right? Well, uh, for the 20 degree angle, excuse me, they're able to hold up to things a lot better. So I'm using a knife that I don't care about. This is an old, uh, really, really bad series Wusthof knife. It's not good. It's not even a Wusthof classic. It's not very good. So all I'm going to do, guys, is I'm just going to go ahead and cut this into, whoa, that is a challenge. My goodness. How do people do this? I don't have a cleaver. Would sawing it help? Is this completely impractical? Because I see corn cut up in this way all the time. A little bit of a slicing motion seems to kind of be essential to get it done into coins properly. But as you guys can see, if I did this with a nice knife, we would be destroying our knife in the process. So instead, we use this knife. 
It might be a little bit under but it's also not the season for coin at the moment. Right? And so this is kind of what I'm looking for. Again, I'm really trying to emulate the coins of coin in a caldo de pollo. There you go. Beautiful. That's it. That's all I'm really looking for. So slightly sawing motion. That timer, by the way, is for the chicken itself. Let's go ahead and just turn that off. I know this isn't very elegant. It would be a lot easier for us to shave off the sides. And this is a slightly more impractical way of eating. I just have a very specific food uh, thing in my head that I'm trying to emulate here, right? Ha! Okay, beautiful. That's that one. And let's do the next one. There you go. Almost done, guys. We have one more thing of coin left to do after this, okay? There you go. It's getting a little bit easier the further down we go. I'm gonna trim off this tip, because that's for a bunch of the fibers. We're sort of nestled under and hiding. And this one. There you go. Okay, so that's those coins of coin. Let's go ahead and do the other one. Woof, I know this wasn't the most elegant, guys. I do apologize sincerely uh, for this process. I know this has been maybe the least elegant thing I've ever done on stream, but this is one of the few times where we like chop and saw something, right? All right, so now let's just, ooh, this one's a tough one. Yeah, right by this part, super, super tough. Okay, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and take out the chicken really quickly so that my chicken breasts don't overcook. The legs and the thighs, they will need some additional time, okay? So we've got a long stream ahead of us today, guys. Let's go ahead and I'm going to use some tongs and I'm going to go ahead and find my breasts. Let's find them. There she is, beautiful. And let's, ooh. okay, let's not drop it though. That's a bad idea. Let's not do that. Let's take it and let's pick it up. It's been beautifully poached. It's nice and tender. Let's take it out. And the breasts, they need to come off before the legs and the thighs because of course white meat. Um, there is no connective tissue in there that we have to really worry about cooking completely, okay? And again, these are metal tongs, but I'm not scratching the bottom with it or anything. And so now, this is probably going to go ahead and continue to cook for at least another 15 to 20 minutes while the chicken breast cools down. Does anybody have any questions for me? Is everybody still tapped in? I want to hear a nice yes, chef. Please and thank you. So let's continue cutting this up into coins. Let's just get that done. This is a bit of a messy process. It's a little bit of a difficult process. Use a serrated knife jack, maybe. I don't know if a serrated knife would do a better job. I think this knife also just is not very good for much. Okay, there you go, that's that one. Let's roll it around. Rolling it around first seems to help significantly. There you go. Almost done, guys. A Little bit more to go with this guy, all right? And cut all the way through. And take it and roll it around, and cut, cut, cut. It's also very small corn. This is not like I've seen corn cobs be much thicker than this. Okay, and then as we get thinner and thinner towards the end, it does just cut up a whole lot easier. There we go. Okay, that's all my corn now nicely and beautifully done. We're not gonna waste any of this stuff right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and take my bench scraper and just scoop it up, just none of the fibers, and I'm gonna put it into my bowl for the corn. Wait, did I put that into my waste bowl? Did that go in my waste bowl? <gasps> Guys, I put that into my wrong bowl. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's okay. That's fine. Nobody noticed. Um, is there a reason why I'm fond of Latin American cooking? Um, yes. I'm going to go ahead and tell you why in just a second. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of all this coin for my waste bowl. Really, really quickly. Whoops, my fault, guys. Won't happen again. Just wash off my hands with some soap because that then touched some raw chicken. There was some raw chicken gloves uh, inside of my initial waste bowl. So just scrub that up, and I'm gonna get rid of this cutting board in just a second. And again, it's fine because the coin's gonna get cooked, so it'll be chill. Okay, so you've asked me, why do I love Latin American cooking so much? So I'm going to tell you why. I grew up in New York. The East Coast, the Northeast, especially New York, is not particularly known for Latin American food. We have really good Dominican food here, but I need you to understand something. I grew up in a white household. I grew up in a Russian household. We did not eat growing up many things that weren't white people food. We didn't grow up eating a lot of things that weren't just Russian food. And so, 
I had a very specific idea of what Mexican food was because I kind of grew up uh, eating a lot of not amazing Mexican food, either sort of the home Mexican food that people really, really associate, right, which isn't particularly amazing. The home Mexican food, you know, uh, think of like the Ortega stuff, right, and then like the really, really bad rubbery corn tortillas and the overcooked meat and the spice packets and all of that nonsense, right? None of it is particularly very good. It's nostalgic to a lot of people, but it wasn't nostalgic for me. So I grew up, I didn't have a lot of very good uh, Latin American food. I used to think that I hated Mexican food when I was a small and dumb, ignorant 13 year old. Okay, and so I had the privilege, I was very lucky to go. I went to Mexico, I went to Mexico on a vacation. And there in Mexico, I got to really, really experience real, true Mexican food, real, real, like what, what tacos are supposed to be, how different they actually are. It's completely night and day the different kinds of sauces, the different kinds of tacos. I got to go ahead and work with a mocajete. I got to work, um, you know, with like that big uh, volcanic rock rolling pin. I got to really experience the simplicity of uh, tetelas and uh, tlacoyos and all of these other things. And it was something that completely changed it for me. And I realized all of these things that were missing from the kind of Mexican food that I grew up with, the char, the smoke, the fresh masa, the freshly made tortillas. And so ever since then, I have taken an incredible amount of inspiration from especially Mexican cooking, above all other forms of uh, Latin American cooking, not because I like those less, just because I don't know as much about them. And so all of these components and all these techniques, they just inspired me so much because they just really, really elevate so many beautiful ingredients that way. Right? Okay, guys. So my station is now set up and ready to go for the next couple of tasks that we have ahead of us. Got rid of the past cutting board. Now onto the present one. Okay, let's just get this nice and flat again. So the slice, slice. So I hope that answers your question. Does anybody have any other cooking questions for me at the moment? Yeah, that was a moment where that basically completely changed the way that I thought about food. I was a small, dumb, ignorant uh, 12, 13 year old. And uh, I think that changed a little bit then, right? So I'm just taking the soup, guys, and I'm scraping up the edges, and we're letting the chicken legs cook for another 11 minutes or so. Because again, of all that connective tissue, because of the fact that they're attached to a bone, they take longer to cook and longer to get them to the point where they're tender enough that we can just go ahead and beautifully shred it up. The corn is going to take some time to actually cook, but before I add that, I do just wanna give my broth another taste, guys. Let's go ahead and just see how this is developing. So the chicken is definitely no longer like hazardous to sip on at this stage, right? Mm. Woo! That is good. That is really good. That, now the spice has toned down a little bit. We have the other flavors from the boiled bouillon, and the broth is getting more and more intense. The vegetables are flavoring the broth. The broth is reducing and becoming really nice and concentrated. Guys, this soup is going to be amazing. So cactus clove, you ask me, what is my, my uh, what is the material that I have? This is a composite wood. Uh, this is called an Epicurean cutting board. I love Epicurean cutting boards for a home setting because they're really thin, they're really light, they don't warp that easily, and they're really good to put in a dishwasher as opposed to other forms of wood. If you don't get an Epicurean cutting board, the only other kind of wooden board I would recommend is investing in a nice butchery block. For the people that don't wanna make the investment to a butchery block, an Epicurean cutting board is my ideal way to go. So guys, let's go back to Mr. Soup. Let's go ahead and now lower in all of this lovely corn. Just get all of it inside and that's all going to get nice and tender and nice and sweet and continue to flavor our ever-growing, beautiful, beautiful soup that we just have developing here. Excellent. Guys, we don't have that much more to do. We have to make the biscuit dough. We gotta shred up the chicken. We got this to cook down now. This is going to be a really beautiful caldo de pollo inspired soup. Not exactly an authentic caldo de pollo considering the addition of dill and other things, but it's going to be delicious nonetheless. Are you guys excited about it? I wanna hear yes, chef, please and thank you. I wanted like those big, big coins of corn. It's gonna be a little inconvenient to eat, but there was just a very specific mental image uh, that I was going for here. Okay, so what do we have left to do? We need to juice some limes, and then we have to actually properly make the biscuit dough for today. And that's the part I'm really, really excited about. So let's talk about the biscuits again really quickly. So why am I doing this dish today? Why am I doing the biscuits? Everything that I wanna teach all of you, I need to make sure that you're all listening. I wanna make sure that all of you are tapped in. Everything about cooking at home is about using up what you have before it goes bad. I have been a hypocrite. I have preached to all of you over and over again, don't throw things away, be creative with them. And yet, there I was the whole time buying the smallest container of heavy cream I could imagine. And yet somehow, 
I would never be able to use it up by the time that it has gone sour. I kept buying it and I kept wasting it. And that time ends now. There is a reason why I don't do biscuits. There is a reason why I didn't do biscuits before. I think dough at home, unless you have somebody who is a dedicated cook, is a novelty. You are not making pizza dough if you work a nine to five. You're not baking bread if you have a nine to five typically, right? The beauty of, and, and, and even regular biscuits, you would think super simple ingredients, but then you still have to roll it out and fold it and roll it out. I don't want to do that. I don't want to create that kind of mess. To me, that sounds like an incredible headache. That sounds like a complete waste of my time. So this is my solution. This is something that I do two birds with one stone. We get the beauty of freshly baked bread in a home setting. You can't feed freshly baked bread. We have these delicious biscuits coming our way. And I'm going to be able to use up all of the heavy cream that I have. The beauty of a drop biscuit. The beauty of the American drop biscuit. I know biscuit means a lot of different things to a lot of different cultures. So a biscuit, you know, most similar to a stone, eaten with savory things. The beauty of a drop biscuit is that we mix it and we scoop it and we bake it. That is the beginning and that is the end. And it's going to be delicious and it's going to be incredible. So here's the even cooler part. You know how baking, you have to have pretty precise measurements for leavening? Not with drop biscuits. With drop biscuits, we are literally just gonna use a scale and we're going to get a one-to-one -one weight of the cream to the actual flour component itself. And it's gonna be lovely. So we're gonna begin that in a second though. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do guys was I wanted to juice up a couple of limes because I wanted to add some lime juice at the very end of the soup as well. So it has that really delicious splash of acidity. So let's just go ahead. I know that was a little anticlimactic. I know that we didn't get to the biscuits quite yet, but this is something that needs to get done nonetheless. So guys, I have my limes and now I will be using one of my new favorite kitchen tools, the citrus press. I will not be using the zest today, Nicopi. I don't really need that zest. Guys, why do I love a citrus press? Why do I love this thing? Why do I love my citrus juicer? First of all, I protect my hands. Acidity is bad if you have eczema, okay? Second of all, you're able to get so much more juice out of it. So here's how you do it. You open it up, you put it face down, not flesh side up, face down. You do flesh side up and the juice is gonna squirt everywhere. And this is a tabletop one. We hold it down and we give it the biggest, biggest press. I know guys, we're going to get to the biscuit dough in just a second, it's gonna be wonderful, okay? And we take it and we juice it, and into the bowl it goes. This was not a very juicy lime. Let's press it even harder, and there we go, okay? Not the world's juiciest lime, but imagine if we used our hands, how little juice we would've ended up getting out of that. And the answer is very little, okay? So let's take it, and we juice this bad boy, and we can hear that squelch. We get all of that delicious lemon juice, lime juice, excuse me. Well, in Spanish, limon because there is no distinction. Okay, and let's get that out of there. Guys, everybody needs a citrus press. I'm a firm believer that everybody needs to have one of these at home. Trust me, they are life-changing. I cannot stand squeezing citrus with purely my hands. I cannot stand it. Okay, let's get some of that juice out now, and then the rest of it. Big, big, big squeeze. Big squeeze, guys. Get all of that lime juice. Beautiful. Does anybody have any questions for me? It can be about this dish, it can be about anything else, because I am here to teach you what it means, that's you. I'm here to teach you what it means to cook at home. And the last one, and I'm just getting this done in advance so that we can just add it to the end of the soup and call it a day. So two total limes for this massive pot of soup, I think is going to be more than perfect for us. Okay, that should be good. Thank you, Mr. Citrus Press. Everybody, please say thank you. Let's go ahead and put him away and into the sink. We go with him. Do I make dessert streams? I do not. And the reason why I don't do dessert streams is because I don't eat desserts as it is. We have so much sugar in our diets normally present, and so that I can eat basically whatever else I want, I try my best not to eat any sugar, and I try my best not to make anything with sugar. So guys, my chicken breasts have now properly and thoroughly cooled down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and glove up for this, just so that it makes my life a little bit easier. And we're just gonna shred up the chicken. That's it, nothing crazy. And we take them and we shred them. That's it, that's all we gotta do. We can use a fork, you can use a knife, you can chop it up. I'm just looking for shreds of chicken. I don't want the chicken skin today though. The chicken skin is gummy. So, but the reason we kept the chicken skin on is for both flavoring the stock and because it shielded the meat. Because that meat inside is now glistening. All right. So we peel off the skin. The skin has done a good job for us. You could fry it, you could get it crispy. We do not need the skin. Okay, 
And now we're going to take it. And the beauty, guys, of a shredded chicken. Did something drop? I don't think anything dropped. The beauty of a shredded chicken, guys, is that it's basically able, with all of its newly found surface area, right? It's able to basically soak it up in all of the pores that we're creating by just ripping it apart. And we're not looking to rip it apart too much. And guys, this is why we gently poach it. We don't overcook the outside of it. Okay? Yeah, you could do that, but also I'm not deep frying at home, chunky yogurt. I'm not going to make chichu gum. Right? Guys, look how tender, look how simple this chicken is. By poaching it and not overcooking it, it easily shreds up, and yet we get to retain so much texture and so much flavor. Nice, big, beautiful peels all the way through. There you go. We didn't overcook it. We didn't get that dry, crumbly stuff. Guys, this is why I cannot stand a lot of people's boiled chicken dishes, like when they're doing like a chicken salad. By plunging it into boiling water, you get this super dry, this chalky consistency on the outside of the chicken itself. It's an absolute tragedy. Chicken, poached chicken, you don't have to necessarily cook chicken in that way. Chicken doesn't have to be like that. It can be so much better, guys. It can be so much different. We don't get any of that chalky consistency by poaching it. Okay, guys, that timer, we have a few minutes left on the thighs. Well, exactly one minute left. Guys, look how juicy this chicken is. I'm going to have a little bite. Mmm, tender, flavorful, despite the fact that it's not immersed in the broth at the moment. It's all going to go back in, guys. It's all going to go back in now. Actually, deboning the legs is going to be a little bit more effort, but we'll get to all that. Guys, look at all these beautiful little shreds of the chicken breast. Got all that done. Got all that peeled up, ready to go. Gorgeous. All the chicken breast, that's going to go into the soup at the end. We add it in at the end so that it doesn't overcook, okay? So let's head back to the stove. And we're going to now go ahead and just pull out the legs. The legs needed additional cook time because dark meat, typically filled with connective tissue attached to the bone, it takes longer food to actually hit the core temperature that we're looking for. And we needed to get to 175 so that we break down the connective tissue and we turn the collagen into the gelatin and then the chicken gets much more melty and delicious. So that timer is telling us that that has now been officially done. Let's go ahead and pull out those legs, guys. Are you excited for this? I wanna hear you, yes, chef. We'll let the legs cool off. We're gonna make the biscuit dough and it's going to be incredible. We're in the final leg. Oh, I say as I drop the leg into the soup. We're in the final leg of it, guys. We're going to go ahead, we're gonna finish strong. We're going to get all of it done. I'm gonna pull out the legs. It's not so overcooked that it's already falling apart because if it was, then it would be impossible for us to actually fish it out in one piece and shred it. Okay, where's my other chicken leg? Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. Let's go ahead and put him onto the plate and let him cool off a little bit. And we're just going to go ahead and keep this pot of soup cooking, guys. We wanna keep it cooking. We wanna get the corn softened. We wanna get the vegetables softened. Okay, so it's all going to take a little bit of additional time. And we're just letting the chicken legs cool off. Everybody, it's time for us to make some biscuit dough. It's time for us to make some biscuits. So, I'm really, really excited about this. This is what I was looking forward to the most out of today. This is where all of it comes together. So again, I'm using the Serious Eats methods for the drop biscuits, and I'll talk about what we're doing, and I'll talk about why we're doing it. Okay, so first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get a baking sheet. We're going to grab a baking sheet. And on this bad boy, we're going to be going ahead and putting on some parchment. Why parchment? So that I believe we get the heat conductivity of the metal below it. The reason we're not using aluminum foil, um, I think it has a higher chance to stick to the foil as well. All right, there you go. And let's do it. Ah, okay, I'm gonna trim this up. So guys, really quick safety thing about parchment paper. Your parchment paper can and will set on fire. It can and will ignite if you don't actually trim off the edges that are hanging off. I've had that happen to me a couple times in the past. Especially because we're going to be doing this at 450, a fairly high temperature. So all I'm gonna do guys, is I'm just going to give this bad boy a little trim and give us some nice flat edges. All right, that's one side. And again, I don't want any parchment sort of hanging off, okay? I might even trim it down to size even more just to make sure that it all fits very comfortably inside of my sheet tray here, guys. Or actually, I could just use my other size sheet tray. The other one, oh, other size, other size sheet tray. 
bit of a tongue twister. And we'll see how much of a better job that one ends up doing. And it's curling up and it's fine if it curls up a little bit, it'll be okay. So let's see how much nicer it fits onto the really, really big one. So give me a second as I get that ready, guys. I just wanna get this set up and ready to go for this in advance. Okay, so that's that. And I set that aside. Let's see, how much better does this fit on now? A lot better, that is perfect. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be looking for. Beautiful. And then we'll be laying everything out inside. I'm going to go ahead and just take this sheet tray and I'm going to be putting it under me until we're ready to use it. All right, everybody. Here's the first thing that you're going to need for the biscuits. We're going to use a scale. The reason why we're using a scale is because I'm looking for an exact one-to-one -one weight wise. I need the weight to be one-to-one, -one, all right? So let's go ahead and first portion out and measure out my lovely heavy cream. And I need to get it into a portable vessel. So maybe like a mug or something would be good. I don't actually have what I wish I had. I wish I had a glass measuring cup of some sort, something with like a spout that I can go ahead and easily pour. Um, I don't actually own one of those surprisingly, which is a bit of an issue that needs to be fixed. So let's go ahead and get, I guess like a mug. A mug is the next best thing that I can at least think of at the moment. Let's do a mug and we're going to go ahead and tear it. So what is tearing? We put it on, we click the button again, and now we need to figure out exactly how many ounces of heavy cream we have, and we're going to be saving some heavy cream so that we can brush the tops. So let's go ahead and pour almost all of it inside. Right, so this is about 10 and a half ounces of heavy cream that we have here. And the rest of this, I'm going to be pouring it into a slightly separate dish, okay? And this is going to be the cream that I brush everything with. So 10 and a half ounces. Can you guys remember that number for me? Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you. 10 and a half ounces and a little tablespoon left over for brushing the tops of my lovely, lovely biscuits. Okay, now let's go ahead and get the same exact weight of the flour. So the beauty of this is that we are just using the same quantity. There is no crazy ratios here to remember. So we're going to use a bowl that is slightly too large so that it's able to compensate and we're able to stir things in it really, really nice and easily. Okay. And we're just gonna go ahead and get that ready to go. And we're going to tear it once more. Guys, I'm using self rising flour. It has to be self rising. Self rising flour has baking soda added to it. And then additionally, it uses a softer varietal of wheat. So this is King Arthur, um, you know, self rising flour. It's a new container. So I'm gonna have to go ahead and open this bad boy up. And again, we're also just looking for 10 and a half ounces of this stuff. Oh, I need to remember to open flour over the sink because it does tend to puff up a little bit. There's like always some flour misplaced. Okay, there you go. So 10 and a half ounces of this stuff. Um, I have no interest in doing that, I'm afraid. Okay. And guys, that's 10 ounces and 10.67 uh, ounces specifically. Let's go ahead and just get rid of a little bit of it. I'm just going to spoon some off. 10.47, 10.56. It's fine, it's biscuits at the end of the day. It is biscuits, guys. These are supposed to be simple. These are supposed to be easy. So weight-wise, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, not volumetrically. Volumetrically, I don't actually know the ratio off the top of my head, but it's definitely not one-to-one, -one, okay? So guys, all I'm going to go ahead and do, this is my self-rising flour. Now, I want my biscuits to be slightly sweet. You don't have to add sugar. In fact, it's not essential in the slightest. In fact, a lot of people don't add any sugar. So to call this a two-ingredient biscuit is a, you know, a bit of a lie. I lie from time to time. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get roughly a tablespoon or two inside. Uh, maybe, maybe just one tablespoon. I'm going to do one tablespoon of sugar into my biscuit dough, guys. Okay? Regular white granulated sugar. I know, I don't normally cook with a lot of sugar. I just think a little bit of sugar in this specific application would be really, really nice for us to have. It'd be a very nice to have. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. 
we need to now thoroughly whisk this. And the reason that we need to whisk this is because we're going to end up with pockets of sugar. Also, I wanna get some salt in there. We're going to end up with pockets of the sugar. And so we need to make sure that we do not end up with such. Let's get some salt in there. And we're going to whisk all of it together, guys. Nice and easy. This is going to be the easiest dough that you've ever seen. So break it up. That's just like a little bit of humidity. That's why it clumps up a little bit in there. Okay. So we're just using this and we're breaking it up. And if you think you've whisked it enough, you have not. You've not actually whisked it enough. So break it up, guys. Get all of the sugar evenly incorporated. Can I please get a yes, chef? I need to make sure that all of you understand. Perfect. I'm glad to hear it. So we're whisking, we're whisking again. You want to go through all the sides. You want to be nice and thorough. You can't over whisk this portion. You cannot over whisk this portion. You can over whisk it when we add the cream. And the reason we can over whisk it then is because we're not looking to develop the gluten too much. You can absolutely sift the flour through this, but I don't think for the biscuit it matters that much. I'm just trying to get rid of the pockets. So everybody, we whisk it now, but we don't over mix it later. By mixing it later with the presence of the moisture, we could get a biscuit that's accidentally too tough. And so to avoid that, we're going to mix this until it's all barely combined. I'm shoving my whisk into the dishwasher. That's all done. I'm getting my soup a little stir so I can give my other stuff some attention right now. My soup is cooking. All my veggies are nice and soft. Nice. That is a delicious looking pot of soup, guys. So let's go ahead and grab a nice little wooden spoon. And all that we need to do, we need to go ahead and mix this. Now, here's an issue. Let's think about logistics. Everybody tap in. Let's have some water first. Let's think about the logistics of this all. Let's say I try to stir this as it is. Actually, it seems to be pretty stable. Never mind. It seems to be good. If your bowl is wobbling, add a towel. I realize that I have a towel under it already. So guys, really, really slowly. I'm slowly drizzling this in. Slowly, slowly, slowly. I'm mixing in my heavy cream. And we're going to add it until it's all just combined. So get some on the sides, and we're just doing this until it's combined, guys. Until it's just barely coming together, okay? So we're adding it in, we're scooping from the sides, scraping up the bottom, getting all the pockets of dough, all of it nicely around. We're going to stop for a second, okay? And we don't overmix it. Okay? And guys, again, this wet towel that's under it, it really does help. So, oh, that was a little too much cream at once. Again, we're just folding it in. We're folding it in. And now it's starting to, because we have a lot more mass in this bowl, it's a lot more difficult. So I'm just gonna do a big splash and just start mixing it and mixing it and mixing it. Again, we're not over developing this. We're not going to mix it too roughly, guys. Okay, we just need all of this to be nicely Combine. So hit those dry spots, hit those dry ends, move it all around. Okay, and we're gonna stop it for a sec. I'm going to get a little coaster plate for it. Mm, so nice sweet cream. Guys, and I'm just gently, gently going in here now, just mixing it all in. Right, I'm just scraping up the bottom, mixing all of it really, really gently. And I'm breaking it up. I'm breaking it up. Okay. And now we're going to go in with the rest of it. We do not need this dough to be completely homogenous. So I need you to think about this almost like a pie dough. If we mix it until it's completely homogenous, you're going to get biscuits that are too tough. Is that clear? So all we're really looking to do is get rid of all the powdery, dough, uh, all the powdery stuff. But once a lumpy dough has formed, that's when we actually stop mixing, okay? I promise you it's all going to come together in the end. So let's stop for a second, and I'm just going to go ahead and just go from the bottom. I'm lifting stuff up, okay? I'm lifting all of it up, okay? And again, these lumps, that's what we're looking for. That's how we get that heterogeneous texture in them. 
and let's continue mix it. And there is no kneading, there is no rolling in anything, nothing. That's how easy it is. And guys, let's get the last of it inside, perfect. And let's make sure that there is just no visible spots of cream anywhere remaining. And we need it to stay lumpy. You do not want it not lumpy. Okay, guys, I'm just getting the last of the powdery stuff. That looks like a done dough for me. That's what it should look like. It needs to be lumpy. If it's not lumpy, congratulations, your dough is overly mixed and you're going to get tough biscuits. So that is now officially done. Let's go ahead and begin the great scooping process. And this is going to start with one of my lovely, one of my favorite kitchen tools, a cookie scoop. Yes, drop biscuits are going to be so much less work. This is why we're doing them today. I'm just going to go ahead and put my dirty dishes away. One second, y'all. Saying y'all in the, in the spirit of these biscuits. Okay, beautiful. All right. Guys, let's go ahead and now begin laying them out. Here is my sheet tray with my parchment. Okay, and we're gonna keep it simple. We're not experimenting, guys. These are not stuffed biscuits. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to grab, which I already took out, my handy dandy cookie scoop. And we're going to go ahead and get in there and get a really, really nice lump of biscuit dough. And we're going to begin setting it down, guys. And we're going to give each of them a couple of inches of space from each other because they're going to expand and they're going to rise up. Okay? Wait, can you cook for me? Well, I already am cooking for you. I'm teaching you how to cook. Also, thank you so much, Cyberpath, for the sub. Thank you, thank you. So let's do probably, I think I can squeeze in three in a row. Something like this. And I'm giving them enough space. Uh, let's do two. I'm thinking maybe two. Okay, let's do two in each thing. What's my favorite meal to make? Rice and beans. Love rice and beans to death. But right now, I just wanna focus on the biscuits for a second. So I'm just getting all of them in here. I'm just gonna slightly move them a little closer to each other. And nice big, 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 big biscuits, guys. There you go. And there you go. And I might just line another one. I'm glad to help out. That's what I'm here to do. Okay, what do we do here? We're actually running out of space quite a bit. Let's see if I can push these up a little further here. And push these guys up further. Maybe I could probably fit one into the middle of each of these. Can you keep leftover dough? I haven't done these yet. This is my first time doing drop biscuits. And so the entire point of this is to see what can we actually do with them. So we'll find out. We'll see. I don't, know, I don't have an answer for you at the moment. I'm sure it will be great left over. Okay. Add that bad boy in. That's that one. And I got enough dough to make a couple more. This dough almost feels like a cheesecake batter. Okay. And now, I'm curious, am I going to have enough space to maybe put a few of them into the middle? Or should I just not mess around with it and get a different sheet tray? Because I have enough to make a couple more. So I'm just trying to figure out what is the correct course of action at the moment. I just really, really don't want them to stick to each other. You know what, guys? We could do two batches. That's eh, a lot of effort. Fine, second sheet tray. Let's go ahead and put this bad boy away somewhere. Let's go ahead and get a second sheet tray out, my favorite. But we're not gonna mess around, guys. We're going to give this a proper amount of love and respect. It's my first time. I don't wanna mess around with it too much. I would like to do what is right in this world, okay? And let's go ahead and just, there you go. That's that parchment. I love trimming parchment paper. My favorite cooking task. Yay. I don't know how much they're gonna spread out. I don't know how much they're gonna expand, right? So I'm being really, really careful with this. Would it be the worst if they did stick? No, I just, I just, it's my first time and I wanna give them a lot of love. I wanna give them a lot of effort, a lot of attention, the kind that you guys wish you had. 
that I'm giving to the biscuits instead. Okay, and let's go ahead and put this on now. Let's get that ready to go. Sorry, sorry, that was too mean for no reason. I have no reason to do that to you guys. Okay, and I'm taking this cookie scoop full of biscuit dough. That's one. And again, it's fine if they're all craggly and not totally smooth. I am worried I might have slightly over mixed mine, but we'll find out how we did. That's that one. And then I have enough for like one more maybe, maybe two more. There you go. Okay. And the last one. Yeah, I had enough of that for that much. Okay. Sweet. Okay, guys. Last step for these biscuits. Last step is we're going to be brushing them with my cream. So let's go ahead and get a brush that I have managed to somehow lose, which I'm not entirely sure how that's possible. Aha, there it is, found it. I found my brush. Guys, we're going to go ahead and brush the tops of them very gently with some cream. And the reason why we do this, we do this so that it gets nice and browned on top. It's basically the equivalent of an egg wash, right? So nicely and lightly brush each and every single one of your biscuits with some heavy cream, guys. Nice and easy. All the way around. Beautiful. Okay. And it's fine if some of it leaks out onto other parts. Okay. And let's go ahead and get the next one done as well. So I'm starting to run out of uh, space, guys. A lot of components, a lot of moving parts. Let's go ahead and get all of these biscuits now glazed up with all the heavy cream. So let's take it, saturate it, and dot, 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 dot. Beautiful, saturate it, and dot, 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 dot. All the way around, saturate it, dot, 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 dot. I'm not really brushing it as much as I am tapping it. I've realized that is the superior method here. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. You guys ready for these biscuits? They gotta go in for 15 more minutes though, for them to actually properly cook. Tap, 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 tap. And last one guys, tap, 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 tap. So, it is time. Super simple, super, super easy biscuits, guys. Let's go ahead and get them into the oven. Everybody, 450 degrees for 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and get each of my sheet trays inside into the middle of my oven. Uh, like that, yeah, that should be good. Okay, into the middle of the oven, really nice and easy. Let's see how they end up doing. Uh-oh. Oh no, I don't have space for two of them. <gasps> Gasp. Okay, I have to actually make a quick fix. Ah, this is not what I wanted to do right now. I'm keeping the oven open a little too long. Okay, let's see if I can do this really quick and easily. And the answer is no, I just dropped the super hot and heavy wire rack. Okay, can I do this? Okay, I did it guys. I salvaged it. 15 minutes. Woof. That oven was open a little too long. I think I might have lost a good amount of heat inside. We did it. The biscuits are now in the oven. Self-rising flour, a little bit of cream. Oh, oh boy. And we've made quite a bit of a mess. So guys, let's head back to the soup. Let's just watch the soup for now. Let's watch them go. I'm going to just quickly go back into the oven and make a couple of adjustments. Make sure that things are sitting evenly inside because they're not sitting the most evenly at the moment. There you go, and there you go. Okay, that's much better. 15 minutes, might need a little bit of extra time. Everybody, this soup is almost finished. The chicken legs are almost done cooling off. One of the last steps that we're going to need for the soup itself, we're going to go in and add the kale now because the kale needs a little bit of cook time. Not too much, nothing too crazy. Let's just go ahead and throw that bad boy on in. You guys excited for this? Are you guys ready? I wanna hear a nice sounding yes chef. We are almost done. The biscuits, the easy two ingredient biscuits that we used up the rest of the heavy cream with. They're now in the oven, they're now doing their thing, and we are going to see how delicious they actually do come out for us today. I'm taking a second to clean up my station. I got a little overwhelmed. This was a little bit more tricky than I thought, but the beauty of drop biscuits, again, guys, I don't think there's that many ways to really mess something like this up. 
It's gonna be easy. It's gonna be delicious, hopefully. It's my first time doing any kind of biscuits whatsoever in a very long time. And so I'm really, really excited to see how they actually end up coming out today. And I'm just going ahead and I'm disposing of a few things, guys. Just getting all of my cleanup done and ready to go so that my kitchen is not a mess. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? Okay, also, this is a really, really good time for us to add in some oregano. We don't add the oregano in immediately because it would end up losing a lot of flavor if we do. So let's just go in with a nice, big, generous pinch of oregano now, and we just stir it all in alongside the kale. And then we're going to taste the soup and decide, do we actually want to thin this out with water? Do we like where it's at? We're going to give this bad boy a little bit of a taste session. Look at that soup, guys. Oh, do you guys want to recap? Is there anybody here that did not see what went into the soup? Is there anybody here that wants a recap session? I want to hear a nice yes chef if you would like to, uh, like to get one. I am just going to go ahead and put a couple of things away really quickly. So I apologize for jumping in front of the camera. It's going to be just a moment, I promise. Just getting rid of a couple of spices, getting a couple of things out of here because we're cooking at home. And that means that we got to stay nice and organized and nice and clean at all times. <sighs> Let me go and have some water. That would be good for me at the moment. The biscuits are baking. The biscuits are going. The biscuits are going to be incredible, guys. I'm really, really excited about them. Do I make sushi? I do not make sushi. I'm going to tell you why. If I lived somewhere where I could get really good quality fish, then I would be making sushi and other fish dishes. I do not live in an area where good seafood is particularly uh, available. And even if it is available in some specialty markets, it's not very affordable either. And so I do not make a lot of sushi at all at home. So everybody, let's talk about everything that went into today's soup and let's talk about why we're doing the soup today. I'm just going ahead and I'm filling up my bowl with some hot water. Okay, so guys, why am I doing the stream? Is anybody listening? I wanna hear Yes Chef from everybody watching. I know I keep telling you guys to say Yes Chef. I just need to make sure that I have your attention. Why am I doing the stream? I'm trying to show you guys what it means to really cook at home. I'm trying to teach you guys how to cook at home. And so today started with the entire inspiration was a pint of heavy cream that I had left over. A really huge challenge for me is that I keep wasting my heavy cream. And so the conclusion that I came to is that my drop biscuits would be the ideal way to use it up. It's no need dough, absolutely no effort whatsoever. You just mix it, you bring it together and you bake it. Nice and easy, could not get much simpler than that. So we're going ahead and we're baking off some biscuits. We started off with a whole chicken. We broke it down, we got the bones, we made a really, really beautiful stock out of it. We took onions, carrots, and celery, finely, finely diced it, sauteed it in olive oil, alongside some garlic and serrano chilies. We added in inspired Mexican cooking, charred tomatoes and charred serranos that have been blended, and we added it and we cooked it down. We added in the chicken stock. We poached chicken legs and chicken breasts in the chicken stock. Then we added in chunks of carrots, onions, and celery. We added in chunks of kale. We added in chunks of corn. We also added in some powdered bouillon. So we have that double intensity of chickeny flavor, the homemade stock and then the powdered chicken bouillon all acting in simultaneously. We will be finishing off the soup by adding all of these incredible herbs once we turn off the heat. And we're going to be adding in some lime juice as well. I want to go ahead and taste my gorgeous broth. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You have no idea how comforting that is. It is spicy, it is meaty, it is warm, it is flavorful. You're hitting every single note that you could have possibly ever desired from a dish like this. That is truthfully remarkable. That is incredible stuff, guys. Genuinely, genuinely incredible. That is really special. That is really delicious. It's meaty. It's savory. It has so many vegetables inside of it as well. And now the final step, guys, we've got to finish getting the chicken and we'll add in the lime juice and we'll add the meat back in. You guys ready for this? So my chicken legs have now been properly cooled off. They've been properly cooled off. So let's just go ahead and get them nicely processed. We cook them a little bit longer than the chicken breasts so that they would get nice and tender because they're attached by a bone, because they have so much connective tissue inside. Guys, chicken legs take longer to cook than chicken breasts. And we poached them. We didn't boil them, but we poached them. Oh, actually, I think I was supposed to do 12 minutes, not 15 minutes. So let's drop my kitchen timer by three minutes. 
I just checked because again, I don't typically do other serious uh, eats recipes. I don't typically do recipes, but this is my first time uh, making drop biscuits. So I went ahead and I used Duga Foods. So guys, all I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to be peeling off the skin. The skin did a wonderful job for us. It kept the meat nice and intact without overcooking the meat. So we no longer have any use for all of this uh, chicken skin. It's a little bit gummy. It's not very pleasant. You don't really want to be eating this stuff right now. Okay. So let's go ahead and get rid of all of it. It's a little bit attached. It doesn't really want to come off, but we got to just kind of coax it off. That's a little scrap of meat instead. Let's go ahead and get all that chicken skin off, guys. In fact, it might be easier if I first break it into a leg and a thigh separately, and then I can probably peel off the chicken. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the rest of the meat off. And now, because of the fact that we properly and thoroughly cooked it, it's just easily falling off of the bone, and we're just going through it, and we're making sure that we're not getting any of the tendons. Guys, you know like those tendons in chicken drumsticks? Very unpleasant. Very unpleasant to eat. You do not want to end up with those in your final soup. Okay, so we're just going ahead and we're tearing up the chicken, all right? And then that's one leg done. And now let's go ahead and do the other leg. So I'm just taking it, I'm snapping it in half, and now I'm just peeling back the skin. It's really, really thin, it's very fragile, it's very delicate. Um, so actually, I don't think I need to peel it that much. Let's go ahead and get it processed. We're getting it done, guys. We're getting it done, we're getting it finished. This is the final steps for this chicken soup. Okay, beautiful. All these little shreds of chicken and none of the tendons, none of the bones. We want all of them gone. Does anybody have any additional cooking questions for me? It doesn't just have to be about this dish. It can be about anything that you would like. We still have a little bit more time together. So let's make the most out of it. I'm here to teach you how to cook. So use me. Okay guys, and now we can just go ahead and pop out. You know, I don't have to teach you how to break this down. It's very intuitive, right? The chicken thigh itself only has like one big bone. And so we just take that off. And now we just get to go ahead and peel all the meat off really nice and easily. There you go. That's one of them done. And now let's go ahead and do the other one. Just go ahead and pop out the meat from the rest of it. And all of it comes Nice, delicious, tender chicken, guys, for our chicken soup today. Let's shred it up slightly so that we don't have massive pieces of chicken. Okay. This is some of the cartilage that we do not want. Where did my cartilage go? <gasps> I think I lost it. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. Okay. Just want to pluck that off. Okay. Is everybody still holding up okay? Everybody still following? All right. And my chicken is now officially shredded. Let's go ahead and just scoop all this out. All of that stuff gone. Guys, the chicken has now been officially shredded. So it is time for the final touches on my gorgeous, delicious chicken vegetable soup. The chicken broth has now boiled beautifully. We're going to add in the chicken. We don't need to cook the chicken any further. It has already done its job. It's already paid its taxes. It's already gone into the cooking dimension. It's done a beautiful service for all of us, guys. So we are just now going to put it back in one last time and shut off the heat. And we shut off the heat so that we don't overcook this chicken. The chicken's already been fully cooked in the poaching process itself. Okay, so now we just mix the chicken in and we're basically letting the pot cool off for just a second. And now guys, here come in the absolute final touches. I'm just going ahead and I'm getting rid of this dirty plate putting that into my dishwasher so that it is done and taken care of. Final touches. Remember my chopped dill, my chopped cilantro. All of that is going in now. All of it is going in now. We add it at the end. Why? We don't want to overcook it and lose all the flavor. It's going to shrink down. It's going to collapse significantly in texture. And now, guys, the whole soup has an extra added delicious herbaceous note to it. And the very last thing is going to be the addition of Mr. Lime Juice. Mr. Lime Juice for that little splash of acidity at the end, for that little bit of freshness, again, off the heat, so that we preserve all of its incredibly aromatic citrusy notes. And guys, that is my homemade chicken tomato soup, completely from scratch. Every single component in this chicken soup was made by us together as we ventured out on this journey. 
I'm just going to go ahead and continue to throw some things into the dishwasher. But we have put so much effort, so much love, everybody. So much blood, sweat, and tears for what is a humble, humble chicken soup. But we respected it. We gave it so much flavor. We had so much technique inside. That is exactly what I wanted out of this. Okay. I'm just getting rid of some stuff from my table. Just going ahead and throwing everything I possibly can into the dishwasher until it is time for us to pull out the biscuits. Guys, the biscuits have also just been perfectly timed. The biscuits are ready to come out. So let's go ahead and let's remove this pot so that we get a little bit of space. Guys, you ready for the biscuits? I wanna hear a nice big yes chef from everybody watching right now. This is the time to do it. But first, let's just get a still of the soup. Oh, wait, wrong one. Still of the soup, nice, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and pick it up. Guys, my biscuits have officially been baked. So let's go ahead and take a look at these bad boys. Oh wow, those actually do look quite excellent. I think I could have brushed them with a little bit more cream, but that is exactly what I was going through with the biscuits. Nicely leavened, nicely beautifully puffed up, nice and simple, nice and warm. Okay, and now let's go ahead and get the next one. That's a good looking biscuit. Could have probably been a little bit more liberal with my cream usage. Okay, I'm gonna have to keep that in mind. Nice and warm, nice and soft. We have to let them cool down just a little teeny tiny bit, guys, before we serve them. So again, the whole point of the biscuits, super easy dough to do at home. We made them, we prepped them, we baked them, and now, guys, these guys are hot and begging to be eaten. But we have to give them just a little second. Ooh, those do look actually pretty excellent. I kind of liked baking it at the top more. It seems like they got a little bit more heat that way on the very top of them. That's a good looking biscuit though. That would have been too many for one tray, absolutely. So let's just go ahead and get these all together. Woo, I don't wanna break you yet. Not yet, guys, not yet. And all that uh, stuff on the bottom that's like the cream. So I'm just gonna have them all cool off on one tray just to make my life a little easier, a little simply. That, that is a big, beautiful pile of biscuits, huh? Beautiful. Oh, we're gonna have them with butter. Don't forget. Nice. You guys saw how easy that dough was to throw together? Did you guys see that? The thing I really wanna see is, can I actually make a sandwich out of these? I'm curious if drop biscuits are firm enough for, and uh, sandwichable. That's what I really wanna find out. I'm throwing away the parchment. Super easy, super, super simple. That, guys, is the beauty of a drop biscuit. Self-rising flour and heavy cream, you bring it together and you bake it. That's all that there really is to it. Am I planning for Easter? I don't celebrate Easter, I'm not planning anything. Everybody, we did it. We did everything. We have done every single last thing that we needed to. Those biscuits, they look amazing. I'm just going to go ahead and throw the sheet tray into the oven as it cools off, just so that we have a little bit more space. That is a beautiful plate of biscuits. Look at that. Not bad. I don't think I did a very bad job with those. This was a really long stream. So, everybody, I believe it is time for us to plate. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. Out of sight, out of mind. Let's pop him over here for now. And I'm going to lift up my absolute cauldron of soup. Look at that soup, guys. Look at that soup. Look at these biscuits. What a shot. What a shot. So let's go ahead and start to plate up a little bit. I'm gonna grab myself a nice bowl and I'm going to go ahead and fix myself a proper bowl of this incredible soup, guys. Meaty, full of vegetables. All right, and now let's go ahead and just plate it up. Get it all into my lovely bowl. Gorgeous. Maybe some more of the other vegetables, please. That's it. That's a good boy. Amazing. There is the lime juice in it. It was added at the end. Yep, absolutely. That looks pretty good, huh? That looks good. I'm really happy with that. Okay, and now let's go ahead and get some biscuits out as well for us. Let's see how the biscuits came out. 
grab a couple of them. They set up nice and firm. I like baking them on top, I have to say. They do, they did brown up a lot more nicely. So these are my biscuits, guys. Come take a look. Nice and properly leavened, nice and crusty. Uh, the bottom got a little dark, which is surprising. But I've got to say, I think that looks pretty good. And this is my gorgeous soup. Everybody, let's do one last recap session. Everything here today was made entirely, completely, and utterly from scratch. No corner is cut. We made our own homemade chicken stock. We sauteed a mirepoix in a bunch of olive oil. We added in garlic. We added in serranos. Okay? We added in some charred tomatoes and charred serranos. We blended it up. We added it in. We added in the homemade chicken stock. We poached chicken legs and chicken breasts until it was nice and tender that we could shred it up beautifully. We added in kale, we added in cilantro, we added in dill, we added in corn, we added more carrots and celery and onions as well for this vegetable loaded, beautiful soup. We shredded up the meat, we put it all back inside. And then to go alongside it, we used up some leftover heavy cream. We made these incredibly simple. You saw how easy that was. No rolling, no kneading, no nothing. We mixed, we baked. We mixed it and we baked it. And these are my lovely biscuits. As a result, nice and crusty. I really want to try a biscuit. We did it. I really want to try one. I really want to eat one now. Let's go ahead and give this bad boy a shot, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a knife and we gotta have some butter. So I'm gonna go ahead and take some butter for this, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and take some butter for this. We absolutely need some. So let's just see. Can I realistically cut one and a half boot potential future sandwich ability? And the answer is somewhat. It's very gentle. It's really, really delicate, huh? Very crumbly. Mmm. Oh my God. Oh, that is so good. Oh my goodness. Get a little butter on there. That is so good. Mm. 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 Guys, I'm just gonna be doing this all the time now. There is no reason not to be doing this. Everybody should be making homemade biscuits. Homemade drop biscuits, two ingredients, absolutely no work. Short work, light work. That is delicious. That is a delicious biscuit. That is so tender. It's not dry at all when it's nice and fresh. Mmm. Nice and crispy. Nice and tender. Tender, tender, tender. And still enough structural integrity. I think these are very sandwichable once they cool down. Absolutely. Guys, that is perfect. I am going to go ahead and get another slice of butter on this and have that as a little treat as well. Mm. I'm really happy with how this came out. Mm. Mm. That is so good. That is perfect. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. I can't believe I've never done it before. Mm. That's what home cooking should be. That's what home cooking should be. Simple. Easy to throw together, uses up leftovers, no rolling, nothing. That was incredible. Let's go ahead and have some of the soup now. Wow. I am really impressed. That came out excellent. Let's go ahead and have some of the soup, guys. Look at the soup. Beautiful, huh? Beautiful color. So much meat, so many different vegetables inside of it. Mm. So flavorful. Mm. So much flavor, so many vegetables. Beautiful. 
Mm. Mm, 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 mm. That is incredible. That was one of the best chicken soups I've ever made. I've made a lot of really good ones. But this one, guys, look at all the different textures. Look at all the different vegetables inside of here. Mm. Mm. That is really good. And that's it. That's everything for today. Everybody, I'm sorry for the long stream. This was three and a half hours. Wow. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate every single one of you so much. Thank you for being here. Next stream is going to be this Sunday, 5 p.m. ET, EDT, Eastern Time. As always, every Wednesday, every Friday, every single Sunday. I appreciate all of you. For those of you that haven't already done so, um, please check out my Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. Uh, if you would like to support the stream, if you'd like to continue to support what we're actually doing here. Um, subscriptions, donations, all those help too, but really the Patreon goes a super long way. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this Sunday, we'll figure out what we're doing soon enough. And we'll, there will be an announcement on Twitter, of course, as always. I hope you all have a really good, safe rest of your Friday nights. I appreciate every single one of you. Hope you all have a good night. Stay safe. 